Thank you for your Great. patience. Thank you. And good afternoon, Senator Bellows, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Laura Fortman, and I am the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Labor. I want to thank you for the opportunity to meet with you today. <clears throat> As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic is having a profound effect on our state. Tens of thousands of Maine people have lost work and are grappling with how to pay bills, how to feed themselves and their families, how to afford their rents or mortgages, and how to stay safe and healthy. In the last seven weeks alone, more than 110,000 Maine people have filed for unemployment insurance benefits. This is more than the number of people who filed in the past three years combined. Never have so many people sought unemployment insurance in such a short span of time. Many people, people who never thought they would have to rely on unemployment insurance have been in touch with the department as a result of this terrible pandemic. But behind these extraordinary statistics are real people. They are our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones, people who are hurting and in need of our help. People such as Janet, who said to us, my situation was quite complex. Like many Americans, I was furloughed from my position and therefore fearful that I would not be able to pay my bills or afford food. And this happened to me for the first time in my life. I needed help sorting through the unemployment details and the person on the phone was extraordinarily kind-hearted. I took a great deal of her time and energy, but she vowed to help me. That kind of perseverance and exceptionalism is what makes our nation great. Or the call we received from the 84-year-old woman who said, the old days of hardworking people working together is coming back, and it is just wonderful to see this sort during such a hard time. Or the young EMT who was quarantined due to COVID-19 exposure, who hadn't, been able, who hadn't been working long enough to initially qualify for state unemployment. He was able to receive benefits after we reassessed his case using wages earned in the first quarter of 2020. These are just a snapshot of the more than 75,000 people who are now receiving unemployment insurance benefits. And I'll be able to announce a larger number tomorrow when the latest unemployment claims data is released. In total, more than $240 million has been distributed to these main people through the Department of Labor. It is an unprecedented amount. However, there are still thousands who are awaiting benefits. And that gap, in part, is due to understaffing and underfunding of the program. But it is also due to a change in who the workers are today and the fact that they are not covered by traditional unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance was created in response to the Great Depression. It was designed to respond to job losses in the 1930s, when most people worked full-time for clearly defined employers. For 85 years, the unemployment system has fulfilled its role as partial wage replacement for workers who lost their job through no fault of their own and were able and available to work. It is an insurance program paid for by employers to help tide workers over between brief periods of unemployment. Unfortunately, many of our friends and neighbors who applied in the early weeks of the pandemic were not eligible for traditional unemployment assistance. They could not meet the monetary eligibility requirements, which are earnings of $5,100 in the last five calendar quarters and at least $1,700 in the previous two calendar quarters. And the requirement to be able to work, available to work, and actively seeking work was particularly difficult to understand during a pandemic. In 1937, a report by the Social Security Board in Washington, D.C. stated, and I'm quoting here, unemployment benefits guaranteed in advance 
certain in amount paid out of a fund built up by orderly and systemic means are clearly more businesslike than any form of haphazard relief hastily set up and financed in the midst of crisis. In spite of the lessons that we learned in 1937, the National Unemployment Insurance Program has not evolved or adapted to the changing economy. Congress was once again forced to hastily set up programs of relief in the midst of this crisis to meet the needs of self-employed, gig workers, new entrants to the labor force, as well as addressing the unique challenges of covering people impacted by the pandemic. Congress passed the CARES Act to help people like Catherine, a self-employed artist and photographer, and Whitney, a cosmetologist struggling to pay her booth fees while unable to work. This situation has been frustrating for everyone. Frustrating for those who can't get through to speak to us, Frustrating for those who are waiting for their benefits, frustrating for my staff, and frustrating for me personally. I want you to know that I am committed to making sure that every mean person who is eligible for these programs gets the benefits that they deserve. The scale and speed of the response to COVID-19 has no comparison. We have expedited thousands of state unemployment claims while concurrently launching new federal programs created by the CARES Act. It has been seven weeks since the passage of Maine's emergency legislation, not quite six weeks since the passage of the federal CARES Act, and three days since the last issuance of federal operating instructions. Determining eligibility and providing benefits has always been a partnership between the states and the federal government. These new programs are no different. While we made some assumptions on how to deliver benefits under these programs, we had to wait for final instructions in order to complete the implementation. The Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program, FPUC, was the first to be implemented. Beginning April 16th, 12 days after operating instructions were made available by the federal government, the additional $600 per week was added to weekly unemployment benefits. Two weeks later, on May 1st, we implemented the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, or PUA for short. This is the federal program created for people who are not typically eligible for state unemployment benefits, and this includes self-employed people. Maine was one of 13 states that rolled out PUA last week, and this is according to data from the U.S. Department of Labor. While 17 states preceded us in some form, 23 other states and territories have yet to implement PUA at all as of this past Monday. I know many people were waiting for PUA. When it launched on May 1st, the department processed over 3,000 claims in the first four hours, and then thousands more claims over the weekend. Actual numbers for the last week, as I mentioned before, will be released tomorrow. Given the many questions I've received about how these programs were implemented, I'd like to walk you through the events of the last two months. You will recall that on February 26th, I met with your committee for a supplemental budget hearing. I presented to you a new administrative funding plan for the unemployment insurance program. For the first time in the program's 85 year history, we were experiencing an administrative funding gap. Like many Department of Labor programs, unemployment insurance is countercyclical. When the economy is good, which it had been for a number of years, there is very little money to administer the program. The core federal grant funding, which covers administrative funding, it covers 100% of administrative funding, has been declining and one-time grant 
opportunities had dried up. For the current program year, the department has received enough federal administrative funds to operate the program for two thirds of the year. This was the ask that I came to you with. We had 13 claims representatives on staff. I would have preferred to have had more, but except for the winter months, it was adequate when the unemployment rate hovered around 3%. In response to the department's request, the legislature authorized access to one-time funds that had been distributed to the states through the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act of 2009, ARA for short, and approved a shift in a portion of, unemployment, of employer unemployment taxes to go into a dedicated administrative fund. The one-time funds were intended to fill the operational um, whole that we were experiencing for the remainder of the program year. And in 2021, we would continue operations using the new administrative fund. The balance of the one-time fund was to be held in reserve for an emergency. And that emergency is here. I am thankful that the legislature authorized access to the ARA funds. That funding has allowed the department to ramp up and therefore help thousands of Maine people during this crisis. Just 18 days after we met the last time, COVID-19 hit Maine and a civil emergency was declared. The legislature and the governor moved quickly on emergency legislation. This included changes for the unemployment insurance program, including flexibility to the able and available requirement waiving the one week waiting period, covering temporary leaves of absence, and halting charging employer experience rating for benefits paid. During that same week, we saw an unprecedented surge in the number of people filing for unemployment. 21,459 people filed a new claim for unemployment that week, up from 634 the prior week. The department immediately began moving staff from other areas of the department and across state government to address unemployment claims. Career center staff had shifted solely to online services to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Those staff were still assisting people with employment services, but demand had begun to decrease. The online chat service shifted to, assist, to assisting unemployment claimants by walking through the claims process, answering questions about unemployment insurance, and resetting passwords for those who locked themselves out of their account. Some career center staff had already received very general unemployment training since they provided part-time unemployment services during the busy winter months. Those staff received a short intensive training and were added to the 800 line. We were able to increase the number of people on the 800 line from 13 to 30. On, Mar on Friday, March 27th, the Federal CARES Act was signed into law. It created three new unemployment programs. They are Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, or FPUC, which is the extra $600 that I mentioned before, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, or PUA, which I described a little bit earlier, and Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation, or PEUC, which provides an additional 13 weeks of coverage. That same day, Recognizing that added assistance was needed, the department began negotiating with a Maine-based contact center to quickly ramp up staffing for the unemployment 800 line. However, um, that was not quite as simple as signing a contract and allowing people to begin answering the phone lines. This meant agreeing on service delivery methods, deliverables and costs, working through technology needs, coordinating security checks, and perhaps most importantly, providing training 
to ensure that those answering our phones were able to help people. Our intent was to expand to 100 claims representatives. The following Monday, March 31st, the 800 line received a quarter of a million phone calls for the day. And we had over 1 million hits to our website. This staggering volume overwhelmed the state's communications network, which led to intermittent phone and network outages statewide. The department worked with Maine IT over the next three days to increase system capacity and reroute 800 lines to keep both the 800 line and the state network functioning. At the same time, we worked with Maine IT and our contractor on alternatives to telecommunications. We agreed to shift the hosting of the 800 line to our contractor while improvements continue to be made on the state network. This was a substantial pivot from our original plan, but our management team and subject matter experts worked through the issues. Both Maine IT and our contractor were invested partners and worked 24 hours a day to make this happen. In response to unprecedented call volumes, we also implemented an alphabetized call day. Starting April 6th, we asked people to call on certain days based on their last name. People whose last name began with letters A through H were asked to call on Mondays, I through Q on Tuesdays, and R through Z on Wednesdays. Thursdays and Fridays had no restrictions. This reduced call volumes to about 50,000 per day. While I know that many people were still not able to get through to someone, the alphabetizing did allow the state network and the 100 line to remain functional. And I thank Mainers for continuing to adhere to this schedule. That same week, we plan to implement the shift in hosting the 800 number and add the contracted staff to as our call one, um, as our tier one call center. Based on the training schedule, we targeted Friday, April 10th as the go live date. However, a massive spring snowstorm resulted in widespread power and network outages across the state. Many of our staff and the contractor staff were set up for telework. Many of them had no power. This continued into the weekend, preventing some from working claims over the weekend. At this point, three weeks into Maine's emergency declaration, USDOL released the first round of operating guidance for the three new programs created under the CARES Act. From USDOL webinars and conference calls with the states about how these programs were going to run, we knew that additional uh, guidance was coming for pandemic unemployment assistance, which was the most complex of the programs since it covers people who are not normally eligible. However, we were able to move forward and implement the federal pandemic unemployment compensation, the $600 per week program on Thursday, April 16th, 12 days after receiving initial USDOL guidance. During all of this, we continued planning for PUA and made the system enhancements that we could without final federal instructions, which arrived on Monday, April 27th. On that Friday, May 1st, we began accepting applications for pandemic unemployment assistance. We created online informational resources and stood up a temporary dedicated toll-free number for questions about pandemic unemployment assistance. Every state is making decisions unique to their situation in response to COVID-19. With PUA, some states that launched before Maine did, did so by accepting applications without the ability to pay benefits or by having partial programs such as initially just for self-employed or only for those who had exhausted state unemployment. It is vital that we balance the need to pay benefits with the need for program integrity. 
An April 21st report from the Office of the Inspector General highlighted concerns based on their prior audits of claims from the Great Recession a decade ago. The CARES Act created these expansive new programs and also provided funding for expanded Inspector General audits. The intent is clear, pay quickly, but pay appropriately. I believe that we have taken appropriate actions to meet this balanced intent. My goal for PUA was to launch a system that both accepted applications and paid claims and ensured that benefits were distributed in a fast and fair fashion to all the newly eligible people. Applications for self-employed people began last Friday and the automatic enrollment of people who had previously been denied is happening now. Initial and retroactive payments to all newly eligible people will start this week. As you may recall, I joined one of Dr. Shaw's daily briefings two weeks ago. I announced that the department would allow benefits for certain cases that would normally require a fact finding under regular circumstances, but we aren't in normal times. Based on the dates of the filings, I decided to allow for the automating of some decisions. Automating decisions means system programming, and this takes staff time and resources. These are the kinds of decisions each state is making. For example, our consortium partner, Mississippi, opted to focus only on PUA and not address other issues that came up along the way. In addition, Maine's law is different than Mississippi's. For example, Maine has alternative base periods and dependency allowances, and those differences needed to be included in our program. The department's next steps are to implement the last of the three new federal programs Pandemic Extended Unemployment Compensation, or PEUC, and to activate the state's extended benefit program. Both programs provide additional 13 weeks of benefits to people who have exhausted their state or pandemic unemployment assistance benefits. Initially, people in this group will be enrolled in pandemic unemployment assistance, along with the other groups that I mentioned earlier. People who have exhausted state benefits are eligible for PUA so long as PEUC or extended benefits are not available. This is currently the case in Maine, so we will be enrolling them in PUA this week as well. Once PEUC and extended benefits are available, we will transfer people to the appropriate program based on the federal operating instructions. After this week, I expect that we'll be paying benefits to an even larger percentage of applicants. I know that there are still people who will be waiting because of an issue that we cannot automate away. My staff are working through this caseload as quickly and efficiently as possible, resolving issues when we can without holding a fact-finding interview. One other issue that I would like to address is ongoing communication between the department and the legislature. In the past, our legislative liaison would field questions from legislators and find answers to those questions. This meant contacting an unemployment staff person to get the answers. Due to the extremely high volume and complexity of issues and new programs, we could not continue this process in recent weeks. However, we are committed to working with you and the governor's office to put in place a process to address constituent issues moving forward. And I'm sure that we will be able to come up with that system by the end of the week. I would also um, be remiss if I did not mention that this week is Public Service Recognition Week. I'd like to take this opportunity to publicly recognize the dedication and the professionalism of the people 
in the department who have been working tirelessly <clears throat> six and seven hours, um, six or seven, I wish it was only six or seven hours, six and seven days a week to help people through this crisis. They have adapted to an impossible workload. They have learned how to uh, telework. They have uh, adjusted to new systems. And they have also been dealing with their own um, challenges related to uh, COVID-19. One of the things that has happened is that the Bureau of Unemployment Compensation staff have been uh, designated as emergency responders during this crisis. So I'm not sure if everyone is aware of uh, some of the other changes that have been made through, the, um, through congressional legislation, but one of the changes was expanding family medical leave and sick, sick leave. All emergency responders, including staff at the Bureau of Unemployment Compensation, are exempted from those provisions, which, um, and there has not been one uh, person who questioned that decision and I just want to say that, like at the beginning of my remarks, uh, the woman I was quoting had said uh, about a particular employee, and I think she said it best, perseverance and exceptionalism are the attributes that I have seen in my staff, and I know they will continue um, to provide that same level of uh, professionalism and, as we move forward. I want to thank you for this opportunity to provide an overview of the work that we've been doing, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Fortman. Um, we deeply appreciate your time. We have a lot of questions. Um, and the way we're going to do questions for members of the committee who are on Microsoft Teams, just like if you're at the horseshoe, if you have a question, you can raise your hand, you can say, Madam Chair, and I will recognize you for questions. And I will be sure to uh, verbally recognize everyone uh, who's online before we proceed to, to the next section. Um, we wanted to start with some of the systems issues. And I think that all of us think that those 13 claims representatives who were with you on March 17th, uh, when this crisis exploded from just over 600 claims to over 21,000 claims, we think those 13 state workers are indeed uh, heroes and we're grateful for how hard they're working. But it's clear that the department needs more resources uh, even now. What financial resources or staffing or other aid do you need to build capacity uh, to be able to provide the benefits that people need? Uh, thank you, Senator. I appreciate the question. I think that one of the um, background pieces of information that's important to also know is that traditionally the Department of Labor would carry on the books hundreds of unfilled positions. Uh, there were vacant positions, they were not funded, and they were there to um, so that the capacity existed uh, in the time of an economic downturn to quickly fill positions. Uh, again, the economy has been good and those vacant positions were eliminated from the books. Um, we have gone through the process of recreating positions uh, and through a financial order have requested uh, additional staffing. We are working with um, actually, and I think Kim Smith, the deputy commissioner, is also on here, and I believe that we can say who we're working with, um, but that yes. we are working, yes, Kim? Yes. So, okay. deputy commissioner, can you introduce yourself, show your video, and, and address that? And we'll be able to see Good afternoon. Well. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Smith, and I'm the deputy commissioner at the Department of Labor. And we created 138 new positions by financial order, and we'll be posting those um, within the next few days and have been working with L.L. Bean to help us um, hire and train those staff. 
So you're anticipating hiring 138 new people? Uh, in phases over the next uh, few weeks, yes. Um, are there features of our current unemployment system that you can talk about that are creating these delays that would be helpful for our constituents to understand? Features of the online system or the process from that initial plane, the steps that it requires on the back end from filing an initial claim to receiving your money? I would say that we have, uh, Senator, again, thank you. If I understand the question, it's with the existing application process. Just are there features of the system itself in terms of how Maine's unemployment system works? Because I think I'm hearing from many constituents who've never filed for unemployment in their lives. And mm -hmm. the system itself is not intuitive. Are there features of the way the system is designed or the way the main system works, either legal requirements or system issues that are contributing to delays that constituents are experiencing? I, I, thank you, Senator, um, I, for that question. I would answer, um, I'd get back to the beginning of your question where you said uh, that, you know, are there things that people need to understand about the system? I think that many of the people who are applying for unemployment insurance right now have had limited experience with applying for unemployment insurance. And what we saw, particularly at the beginning, um, was that people did not understand that there were eligibility requirements, that you needed to um, meet certain monetary obligations in order to be eligible. Uh, people did not understand the requirement of being able to work, available to work. Um, so I think that you're absolutely right. There is a lot of um, lack of knowledge about how the program works that was confusing for people. Um, there were um, many people were having uh, challenges because they uh, did not... Um, uh, have the dates that they needed for their employment. Um, so it, it is uh, the system itself, as I said, was designed in the 1930s for a particular kind of worker. Um, and many of the people who applied early on did not fit into that category. Senator Gehring, you have a question? I do, thank you. And actually, it, it's a question with a couple follow-up questions at the, at the leave, leave of the chair. Would I be allowed to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for being here, Commissioner Fordham. Um, we certainly appreciate the long hours you and the staff have been putting in for the few of my constituents who have been able to get through on the phone. They've said that the staff has been extremely polite and helpful. Um, I, I know you were doing your best, and, and I appreciate that. It, um, and I appreciate all our workers and our the main IT's attempts to solve these problems. We all understand that no state would have known to build a system that could accommodate the tremendous and unprecedented influx of unemployment filings. But today we're re addressing the response, not 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 what happened before, because we we never would have known. The, the extent of the, the need, but the response from your department and Governor Mills' administration. I have heard from hundreds of Mainers who see the department's and the Mills' administration's response as completely inadequate and an utter failure. Thousands of Mainers have gone seven weeks without a paycheck. To me, this is completely unacceptable. Back in March, soon after the coronavirus outbreak reached New England, the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training realized that their system, one nearly identical to ours, could not handle the volume of calls it had started to receive. They immediately contacted Amazon Web Services and built an entirely new system in 10 days. To date, this state that is only three quarters the size of Maine has processed 70,000 more claims than we have. At any time, did you reach out to companies like Amazon for help in dealing with the problems caused by an overwhelming number of claims? 
Senator, thank you for the question. And I am familiar with Rhode Island. I would uh, respectfully disagree with the characterization that our system was nearly identical to Rhode Island. Rhode Island was working from a mainframe system that was much um, different and older than ours. Uh, the particular system that we were using and we are using was developed in the um, about four years ago. Uh, it was not in danger of uh, failing to um, hold up to the uh, to the um, to the stress. It was technically uh, solid, and to engage in um, new uh, technology that was not necessary. At, or at least in my opinion, um, it was not new technology that we needed. It was additional staffing. Um, and I also would say that the numbers of claims that we have processed, I'm not familiar with Rhode Island's numbers, um, but uh, it 70, roughly 80% of the people who have filed claims here in Maine um, have had their eligibility determined. So you did not reach out to Amazon, is that correct? That is correct. Um, then I'm wondering about Google. When, when New York State's unemployment claim systems crashed, they reached out to Google, who created an entirely new system in a little more than a week. This included the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. That was back in early April, a month before Maine started accepting the PUA claims. Did you ever reach out to Google for help with claim system? So Senator, again, what I would say is New York's system was very different and I will stress that our system has never crashed. The phones have crashed, but the online processing system has not crashed. It is processing claims. Um, and no, I did not reach out to Google either. Well, from what I, the reports I am hearing from Mainers is that the glitches in the system are causing them to have to call to get their accounts straightened out so that the failures in the computer system are causing the phones to be overwhelmed because the filings are incorrect. Just yesterday, I spent some time on the phone with executives from Google. It only took a few hours to find the right people there and to set up a conference call. They told me that beginning a month ago and continuing today, they have the capability to set up an entirely new system for Maine to get us through the current crisis with claims and backlogs. They said they can do this for about a million dollars and that it could be up and running next week if we signed a contract today, which I'm sure the governor could get DAFs in here if it was necessary to look at that contract. They, they have sample contracts from the other states they are working with, which is New York, Florida, Texas, and Georgia. It, it would only come to about $10 for every claim that has been filed that where people are waiting. If Now, if a single senator can get all this information in a few hours with a couple of phone calls, why hasn't the commissioner and your department been able to do the same thing. These Google executives told me that they had repeatedly reached out to people within state government in Maine offering to help us. So far they have received no reply from you or anyone in the current administration. They could have ended the crisis in unemployment claims related to the computer problems a month ago if you had reached out to them. They could have gotten much needed money to set tens of thousands of Mainers weeks earlier if you had simply called them. Why did you not reach out to any of these companies who could have helped our suffering neighbors get the benefits they needed by getting our system, computer systems fixed so that it wasn't glitching out and causing them to have to call on the phones, which are never answered? So, Senator, thank you for the, uh, the question. Um, and again, uh, what I, I would like to um, say a couple of things. One is that I want to say again that the uh, computers in New Hampshire and Florida are very different than in Maine. 
And while I am sure that they are processing claims, I want to stress that in Maine, we are also processing claims and that there are tens of thousands of Maine people who are currently receiving over $240 million in benefits that the computer system has not crashed. I agree with you that getting through on the phones is incredibly challenging. We are handling about 1,800 calls a day at this point. Um, and, um, Senator Guerin, um, I'm gonna, I have a bunch of folks who've asked to ask questions. So thank you. We're going to move around the first few and then return to you. Um, Representative Sylvester, then Representative Lachman, and I see Representative Bradstreet has a question as well. Um, Representative Sylvester. And uh, let's limit, limit follow-ups to two follow-ups and that's it. And then, so that every member of the committee can ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll just, since apparently I broke the sound system during my introduction, um, I will just briefly in reintroduce myself. I'm uh, Representative Mike Sylvester. I am the House co-chair uh, for Labor and Housing, and I represent the great city of Portland. Um, to follow up on um, Madam Chair's question about the system uh, and design um, and perceptions of the system, I have fielded a, a fair amount of questions about how to get walking people through screen from through screen about how to answer this question or that question. And I would say that just as a, as a good example, um, the question I get the most is that when people are on the online screen, how do I file a claim? And I have to explain that it's the logo that's over on the left um, that's, that's the, that says re, uh, re-employ me. You click on that, right? And so, people who are both very tech savvy and not tech savvy have the same exact question. So that's just an example of ways that maybe it isn't as intuitive um, as one might hope. And, um, and I'll just give two quick other ones, which is that um, you know, when people get kicked out, uh, which I've had a lot of calls about, that they're, you know, they're in the middle of the, of, and it just stops or freezes, uh, well, that might be their own inner, their perception is that the system has crashed. And so I think that that's, um, you know, I, I think that that's what people are responding to. Um, and then the messages that people get, um, you know, saying, you know, that they have, they're in this category or that category, or when they're in the middle of ha having to go back to the FAQ. So I think that was what the Senator was trying to get at, is that the system itself, it, it doesn't have built in help as you're going through it. And it's, it's not maybe as intuitive as it could be. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could respond to that just as we're looking forward um, to trying to figure out how if should such a thing happen again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Representative Sylvester, and I hope that nothing like this ever happens again in my lifetime. Um, but um, uh, in terms of the perception, the lack of intuitiveness about the system, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, back in February, um, we agreed to participate in a um, in a evaluation might be too too um, strong a word, but uh, an outside organization looking at how our system was designed and if there were things that we could do to um, improve the user experience. Uh, so in February, um, we had people from the Century Foundation, the National Employment Law Project, and others come walk through the system with us. Uh, they um, were also conducting focus groups across the state of Maine, and they were going to be providing that information back to us and to other states that had agreed to participate in their, um, in their survey. Uh, we were looking forward to receiving that information and to um, making the, re the suggested, um, assuming that there would be suggestions, um, and I'm sure there would be, um, changes to the system. But when we were in response to a crisis mode, did not seem like the, the time to make those changes. I would say moving forward, there are two things that we can do. Um, one is to improve our communication, whether we have been adjusting the uh, text boxes on the actual application process itself, 
uh, as well as putting information on our website, Facebook page. Um, but I agree, moving forward, we definitely have to improve how we talk about it. But the structural integrity of the program itself, of the system itself, uh, was not something that I had any question about. And that is why I did not try alternative technological solutions at a time when my goal was to get benefits out to people as quickly as possible. And again, I want to say that there are tens of thousands of Maine people who are currently receiving benefits, over $240 million in benefits. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm, I'm glad to, to hear that, uh, you know, that we were looking forward in that way. And I think that uh, we've had sort of an unprecedented focus group uh, of, of the system. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and the legislature and this, certainly this committee uh, would look forward. And I think that that's one of the things that the main people are looking for is, is to, to know that, um, to recognize that the system uh, doesn't always function in, um, in an intuitive fashion. It doesn't, it, it's, it's often confusing to people and that, uh, you know, moving forward, uh, anything that we can do to make that simpler and easier and more self-explanatory uh, now may not, is not the time uh, to try to do it, but anything we can do now to explain the system the way it is right now, we, we, you know, we, we'd certainly be willing to work with you, and I'm sure the full legislature would be willing to do that as well to help get out uh, communication. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to recognize Representative Lachman, uh, who's online, and then Senator Lawrence, and then Representative Bradstreet, and Representative Cuddy, um, but I'm going to pause for a minute and take the chair's prerogative. I just want to read this list. I mean, this system was installed in 2017. It was rolled out in December of 2017. I served on the Labor and Housing Committee at that time. So did Representative Sylvester. So did Representative Austin and Representative Lachman. I'm just going to read the headlines from that period because we held hearings about how problematic that system installed under Commissioner Bucara, under Governor LePage, was. WGME, unemployment system upgrade, causing frustration for filers. Kennebec Journal, this is January 28th, 26, uh, 2017. State's unemployment filing system continues to frustrate Mainers. Kennebec Journal, one week later, legislators discuss complaints of labor officials. Two weeks later, legislators continue to express concerns about unemployment filing system. March, and forgive me, this is 2018, press <coughs> Lawmakers still seeking fix for Maine unemployment filing system. March 11th, Maine agency botched unemployment system rollout, destroyed records. March 11th, how Maine bungled rollout of new jobless claims system. March 12th, and this is again, 2018, under the Governor LePage and Commissioner Butera. Lawmakers, and that was some of us in this room, Rebuke Labor Department over claims of rushing unemployment system and destroying records. March 12th, memo calls a new unemployment filing system a failure. March 14th, Labor Department fails to respond. March 14th, Press Herald Editorial. Our view, as Maine's jobless claims system fails, state blames those hit the hardest. March 15th, Department of Labor memo dis details disastrous rollout of unemployment system. March 18th, Maine Department of Labor still mum on charges that botched system is hurting Mainers. March 22nd, legislature seeks investigation into unemployment system. March 22nd, lawmakers request investigation. March 23rd, Maine Department of Labor's new unemployment system to be investigated. Yes. So I will Please. stop, but let me just say, we have all of these headlines. We knew the unemployment system was a problem in 2018 and 2017. So Commissioner, I know that you were not um, Commissioner in 2017 and 2018. You did not roll out this system. But to, to Senator Guerin's point, is it possible that there could be improvements made to the system that would help Mainers? Is it possible that we could seek additional technical support, regardless of which company we use, which vendor we use, is it possible that there could be systemic improvements to the system? And that some of the problems were written into the system when it was paid for, when it was designed, when it was put into place two years ago. 
Senator, thank you for the question. I, I think that there are always opportunities to improve a system. I think what I was faced with was, was it a system, the foundation that was stable and able to deliver benefits in a time of crisis? And it was my judgment that we were better um, that Maine people would be better served to get benefits out to them than to try to recreate a system during a crisis. And again, that does not mean that I did not think that the this was not that it was like a perfectly user friendly or an intuitive system. I did not. We were looking at ways of making changes and approaching that again, as I said in February before this hit. Um, but at the time of a crisis, my goal was to get benefits out to mean people, and this system has not crashed, um, and uh, we we are getting those benefits out. Representative Flossman, you're you're next, and Senator Lawrence is on deck. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, yes, I do have a question for the commissioner. First, I want to say how predictable of you to blame this mess on Paul LePage. Now, my question for the commissioner uh, related specifically to the restaurant industry and going back to how this all started. Commissioner, as you may recall, it was on Sunday afternoon, March the 15th, that Governor Mills issued her declaration of civil emergency, a unilateral declaration that empowered her to shut down businesses, seize private property, impose house arrest on people. We've never lived under anything like this ever before in Maine. In any case, on that day, reporters asked Governor Mills about what's going on in other states at the time. They asked her, Governor Mills, other governors are shutting down restaurants. Are you considering doing that? And Governor Mills responded, no, we're not considering shutting down restaurants. Well, as we all know now, not much more than 48 hours later, that is indeed what Governor Mills did. With the stroke of a pen, she shut down every restaurant in the state and threw tens of thousands of people out of work without notice. And I want to know, Commissioner, did Governor Mills give you any kind of a heads up to let you know what was the avalanche that was going to land on your head at the department? So... Um, Representative, I, 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 I'm not sure how to answer that question. I think that we all started hearing, um, you know, by looking at other states and what was happening. I don't know that anyone uh, could have been prepared, and I don't think that there was any state that was prepared for the um, for the the widespread impact that COVID-19 has had. So you didn't get a heads up from the governor, I take it. She told everyone else she was not considering that, and then bang, she did it. And again, tens of thousands of people thrown out of work, and a lot of them still waiting for their check. Senator Lawrence, you're next. Thank you. I have to figure out how to turn on my mic. How are you doing, Laura? <laughs> I'm hanging in there, Senator. How are you? Good. So I have a couple of uh, unique questions that relate to my district and geographically where it is. But first of all, I, I want to thank you and the Mills administration to how quickly you responded to this and how well off Maine is in this pandemic. Um, 35 minutes from where I'm sitting is Essex County, Massachusetts. And I know you know that because <clears throat> you went to UNH and you know this area very well. But in Essex County, Massachusetts, one out of every 75 people has been infected by the coronavirus. Whereas in York County, where I am, it's one out of a thousand. And one of the unique aspects of my district is that we have about 10,000 people who travel to New Hampshire or Massachusetts to work, and we have 10,000 people who travel from New Hampshire and Massachusetts here to work. So while everybody thinks everything is so much greener on the other side of the Piscataqua Bridge, I can tell you I'm getting equally as many complaints about the New Hampshire unemployment system, the Massachusetts unemployment system, constituents calling me, asking me to try to help resolve their problems in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. So it's, 
it's kind of universal on what's going around. And, and I also want to thank you because early on, to give you an example, I have a constituent who owns a restaurant in New Hampshire that had to close immediately because New Hampshire closed its restaurant. And they didn't even know whether they apply to Maine, apply to New Hampshire, what do they do? They had Maine residents and New Hampshire residents working at that um, New Hampshire restaurant. So your, your office was very helpful in getting them to understand they had to go to New Hampshire. They were very frustrated with the New Hampshire system. It was very slow and very problematic. Um, in thinking of that, how do you think we've done, and I'm not talking about the PUA, but how do you think we've done in comparison to New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and some of the other New England states in responding to these unemployment benefit claims? Um, Senator, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the question. I think that if you look at how we rolled out our programs, we're about in the middle of the pack in terms of the country. Um, I think that, uh, you know, um, in terms of New England, the only New England states that have pandemic unemployment assistance up and running are Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Um, you know, Maine, we just rolled it out on Friday. We're talking to our colleagues in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Connecticut. I think this has been, you can pick up a newspaper anywhere in the country um, and insert the, the same stories. This has been incredibly frustrating for people everywhere, for departments of labor everywhere. Um, I think that later this week, uh, when we start rolling out the benefits for pandemic unemployment assistance, when this is all said and done, um, I'd say we're, we're going to um, be looking uh, like we were one of the earlier states. Many states began accepting applications but were not delivering benefits. Um, but I think I states all over... I thank you for that, and, and whatever more assistance you need from us, uh, you'd be very vocal about that. My, my next question, my last question deals with, in my private life, I practice law, and a lot of what I do is estate planning. And I've seen a spike in estate planning, not only from healthcare workers, but from a lot of workers who see themselves having to return to work or having been forced back to work. And it's kind of frightening that they're now thinking about, I need to have a will, I need to have a power of attorney if I end up, you know, in, in the hospital, unable to get out. Who's going to take care of my kids? Who's going to be guardians of my kids? So I wondered if either now or maybe during one of your briefings with Dr. Shaw, you could speak to what are the rights of those workers in saying, I'm concerned about the health care, because some of them, and also face the border issue too as well, because some of them are Maine residents having to travel down to Massachusetts or southern New Hampshire where the infection rate is, is so much higher. So thank you, Senator. There are a couple of issues there. One is, you know, uh, and I don't know that you were asking this specifically about whether or not those people have any protections in terms of unemployment insurance and accepting suitable work. And if, that, if, that's, if that's part of the question, Pandemic unemployment assistance um, has uh, specifically provided some provisions in there where uh, someone may be able to uh, refuse what would normally be suitable work if there were um, specific health reasons. Uh, since it's a, one of those cases, and as an attorney you'll know this, um, it's an it depends. So it would require understanding the facts around um, around the case, uh, but there are some provisions built into pandemic unemployment assistance, and I'd be happy to elaborate on that at a different time. How does that affect um, cross-border issues when they may give, be getting the unemployment assistance before right. they So again, pandemic unemployment assistance is a federal program, so the law is the same, and there's a checklist how it's interpreted by each state may vary slightly, but um, but there the, the law is a federal is a federal law and a federal protection. So if they work in, New, in, in Massachusetts under the pandemic insurance, are they getting it through that state or are they getting it through Maine? If they are employed 
in Massachusetts, unemployment insurance, you're covered where your place of employment is. So if they're what employed the here in Maine, pardon? What about the PUA? Yeah, that's, that's, that's run through individual states, Senator. So they would get their unemployment through Mass, but the PUA through here in Maine? So Pandemic Unemployment Assistance is a federal program, but it is administered through the State Unemployment um, Bureau. So okay. in Massachusetts, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance in Massachusetts is run through the Massachusetts Department of Labor, just as here it's run through the Maine Department of Labor. Thank you. Senator Lawrence, I know that sure. every member of the committee has other questions, so we're just going to move to uh, Representative Bradstreet and then Representative Putty, and we can definitely come back to you. Um, I think there are a lot of questions about the PUA that we were planning to ask a little bit later in the hearing, because I know that's a huge issue of interest. Um, Representative Bradstreet. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here today. Uh, I have several questions. I'll try to get through a couple of them, but... Uh, and, and we will be rotating back. Okay, so I'm asking you. each person to just stick to one question with two follow-ups, and then we'll come back to people. Thank you. I'd just like to say, in regards to comments that were made a few minutes ago, that I believe in May of 2019, OPEGA reviewed the unemployment insurance system in Maine, and they thought things were working pretty well. As a matter of fact, they gave it a good bill of health. So I just don't want people to be left with the impression that we had a floundering system inherited from the previous administration. Uh, when this thing hit. I think that's a misrepresentation and it should be clarified. Anyway. Um, uh, Reverend Leonard Bradstreet, you have a question for Senate? For yes, I do. Okay. Uh, in light of the statements that the department has had to wait for federal instructions and help on some issues, did the department ever contact anyone from Maine's congressional delegation for help? I, I, this was not that just Maine was looking for uh, guidance. We've been in touch with the, um, I don't recall if we asked specifically, but we've been in touch with the congressional delegation throughout this. Uh, you know, I, I asked this question myself, so I, I uh, requested some information from Senator Collins' office, uh, and they said guidance from the Department of Labor provided to the states between April 2nd and April 10th. Since that time, we have not received a request from the Maine Department of Labor for any mm -hmm. assistance in order to implement the pandemic unemployment assistance for self-employed people or assistance connecting with the U.S. Department of Labor for additional guidance or clarification. Uh, aside from all of that, if you believe you did not receive adequate information to start the impl implementation, what proactive steps did the department take to rectify that? So we were part of, um, you know, the National Association of State Workforce Agencies. We're part of the National Governors Association that we were working as uh, other states. It's not as though Maine in particular did not receive guidance. Plus, we were in direct contact with the department, the U.S. Department of Labor. One last follow-up, yep, yeah. and then we're going to go down okay. to Representative Perry. Uh, We've mentioned Google and a couple other places. Were there any other businesses or organizations that may have been had some expertise with these issues that you have contacted and asked for help? So I believe, as my deputy said, we're uh, currently working with L.L. Bean to help us with some hiring that we're doing. Um, we've had conversations with a number of, uh, of vendors um, but again, our goal has been to uh, take the system that we do have because we felt it was structurally sound and work as quickly as possible uh, to uh, get benefits out to Maine people. Representative Cuddy, you're next. And then Representative Carney. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Fortman, for being here. And um, going back a little bit to some of what has been said, it sounds as though the department has been working primarily on gearing up staff-wise. You talked about a, a call center that you've been working with, now working with L.L. Bean. 
this new 138 people that you're interested in hiring, the way you've been staffing up, um, as opposed to technology. And I, I, uh, I left my job in uh, a couple of weeks ago for COVID related reasons and did file for unemployment personally. And I found, uh, while I didn't find the system to be intuitive, I never had a problem getting onto the system itself. It, it never crashed. It's always available. I'm able to check my weekly certifications, do all the things that you have to do when you're uh, unemployed and uh, seeking unemployment insurance. Um, this, the problem that I have had people talking to me about is their inability to get through on the phones. And that sounds to me like that's what you've been primarily trying to address. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct, um, Representative Cuddy. And one of the reasons, it's not just getting uh, additional people, it's that um, normally if we hire staff, we spend three weeks of intensive training with staff. And then for the next three to six months, they receive individual coaching. And that has been absolutely impossible to achieve. And so, um, but the, the main problem is how do you go from a small group of people who are subject matter experts, ramp up that expertise and make it available um, to the people who need it? Absolutely. Um, and I want to also um, put this a little bit in perspective for myself as well, because I find that in this time where so much of our lives has been really altered uh, by this uh, COVID-19 crisis, um, if we were having the problems that we're having right now during a regular time of unemployment, even at a higher period in winter or something, I would have a, a lot of a very hard questions. But we are currently, you mentioned 21,000 uh, applicants one week when it had been 600 prior. I mean, that's, that's 30 times the number of applicants suddenly. Um, staffing is, is obviously, to me, the issue. And where we have now over 100,000 people, um, some 75, 80% of whom have begun receiving benefits already, but we're trying to address mm -hmm. the problems for the, the few or the, the number who haven't started yeah. receiving benefits mm -hmm. yet. What can we do to help you with the staffing? Is there anything that you need legislatively to happen? Uh, what can we do to, to make that uh, process faster and easier? Oh, I don't know what can be done right now. I mean, that's why we reached out to L.L. Bean to try to help us doing some of the interviewing for us and some of the screening um, because we just don't have the staff to even um, move away from the work that they're doing in order to participate in, in that uh, initial interviewing and screening. I think one of the things I would ask for is that um, moving forward, we're creating new positions. We're going to have to get those on the books. I think making sure moving forward that uh, the depart that you, that there's a recognition that um, keeping vacant positions on the books for the Department of Labor is absolutely critical in order to be able to ramp up um, in a time of an emergency. The other thing that none of us could have predicted. I mean, I was labor commissioner during the Great Recession. What's different about that and different about this? Or there are a couple of things. The first is that we at least had a little bit of time, some warning, so that you could start bringing people on, start hiring, start training. And this time it was virtually overnight that we were hit with it. Um, and then the other thing was that the way um, we were structured was we had staff here in the office and we had to... Um, figure out because of COVID-19 how to take staff who may have been, um, you know, had uh, had compromised immune systems or may have been at risk to physically come into the office and and put together a whole new system that allowed us to perform this work through um, remotely. So about half of our unemployment insurance staff are um, working remotely. Um, so those are the, the challenges that we face, Representative. Um, and uh, we're looking at how can we do training differently if we're training and interviewing people remotely. Um, so, and, I, and I'm open to suggestions. So as, as my last follow-up then, um, 
is there, uh, was there previously any cross training that went on with other departments so that there were people who had some knowledge base around unemployment who could move in? Or is there any cross training like that at all done in the department? So in the department, uh, the two bureaus that are most closely related are our Bureau of Unemployment Compensation and our Bureau of Employment Services. So those are the career center staff and they have some familiarity with unemployment, like a very uh, baseline knowledge, uh, not in-depth knowledge, but, um, and that's the other difference from uh, other recessions, is that typically what would happen is you would start seeing uh, plant closures, and we would have a team that would go out, they would meet with uh, folks on site and talk to them about unemployment insurance, about health insurance, about possible job retraining, all of those things. And so we've had to adapt that and try to provide it, it through um, Zoom. We do Zoom, and by we, I mean our staff at the Bureau of, Employ Un of Employment Services, as well as partnering with unemployment. But um, there was just not that, um, that site that services could be provided on that we've had in the past. And so those staff are the ones that are closest, but no one had, uh, you know, people could tell people how to fill out an application, but in terms of explaining um, unemployment, uh, that, that depth of knowledge just uh, wasn't widespread. Thank you. Representative Carney and then Representative Rikerson. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, thank you and thanks uh, so much, Commissioner Fortman, for being here and answering our questions today. Uh, I have one follow-up to Representative Cuddy's question, which is the positions that you uh, are imploring us to retain, you, I think you called them the vacant positions mm -hmm. that were on the books, when were those eliminated? Uh, they've been eliminated over the past 15 years, um, so it seems like every time uh, people are are looking for budget savings, even those the, even though those are um, uh, federally funded positions, if they're filled, uh, they they look like you're carrying more um, state employees than you actually are. So it, it's been. It's been probably at least um, the last 10 years that positions have been eliminated. Okay, so moving forward, that's one thing that we can fix. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk about another issue that perhaps we can fix moving forward. The, I see that you, it sounds like you've been trying to uh, eliminate the, the pressure points that come from the lack of staffing by automating a lot of approvals of claims or denials of claims. When those claims are denied, does that mean that those claimants get forwarded on to the PUA system? They, and can you they, please explain whether they have to go through the process again or not if they've been denied for that reason? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, uh, Representative. Um, the, the, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, that um, so the, the interplay between state unemployment insurance and the new pandemic unemployment assistance, one of the eligibility requirements for pandemic unemployment assistance is that you must not be eligible for state unemployment. So what some states are doing is they make you apply for state unemployment insurance you are denied, and then you must reapply for the pandemic unemployment assistance. One of the ways that we are streamlining it is that um, if someone has already applied for state unemployment insurance, they are being denied, but they are immediately being rolled over into pandemic unemployment assistance. Now, this gets to one of the points that I believe both uh, Senator Guerin and uh, Representative Sylvester raised about the system uh, not being clear about what's happening. People are receiving notifications that they're being denied, and that does escalate anxiety. It's, and that is something we do need to, uh, to correct. We've got a new message on there now, but I understand when people are anxious, they don't it's hard to absorb information when you're worried about how you're going to pay your rent. 
Um, but uh, the de being denied for state unemployment insurance is actually a necessary step and you will automatically be enrolled in pandemic unemployment assistance. You will not be required to fill out a new application or do anything else. Great, thanks for clarifying that. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about, and um, it has to do with the stress and the anxiety. The constituents who have, have reached out to me, some of them have found the system to work very flawlessly and smoothly, and they are they have no complaints about it. Others had glitches and were able to reach out to people, I think in the Machias Career Center, who were able to fill in and answer their questions. And they, you know, to echo what everybody else said, the staff uh, have been extraordinarily helpful. One of the big causes of stress and anxiety for, as you mentioned, for people who, you know, don't know if they're gonna be able to put food on their table or pay their rent to take care of themselves and their family, is the hang up with the phone system, no pun intended. But they, um, is there a way to create a triage within the phone system that might also eliminate some of the crunch that you have with regard to training people, where perhaps you can create a triage system that will shunt all of the people who are locked out in one direction um, for new hires to handle who are only trained on that issue. And then another, I had a couple of categories here, um, a phone line for people who have been instructed to call in because I'm getting complaints from people who have been told to call a number and then they call, I think it's the appeals line, and then the appeals line says no calls are being accepted at this time. And then there could possibly be another um, category for people who have an, who have an unexplained problem in duration of more than two weeks that go to kind of more highly trained troubleshooters. So thank you, Representative. And uh, it's good to hear about the Machias Career Center. Uh, that was one of the first things uh, that we did was we did training for Career Center staff on password resets because we were hearing repeatedly that people were locking themselves out and needed that sort of assistance. And so we were encouraging people to reach out directly to the career centers to provide that kind of um, assistance. The way that the phone system works uh, right now is on the, um, uh, the regular 800 number. The, um, the contact center is the like tier one support. So they take the incoming calls. Um, they have, we've worked with some of their staff to do like an internal tier two to do pretty much what you're saying, representative. So I take regular calls. It's a simple question. How do I fill out this application? A person who's received basic unemployment insurance assistance takes that. If they have a problem, it gets elevated to their tier two contact center person. And then our um, unemployment insurance, our bureau staff is the, the, the tier um, three, I guess, at this point, for the complicated systems, the bottleneck is still that that group of experienced people is so small. Um, but we are trying to do that kind of triage. Um, we've also done additional training for career center staff to handle uh, certain other kinds of issues. Um, there are issues around name changes, and we are trying to segment those representative. We're also trying to identify what are the key problems that people are having and how do we, um, how, can we resolve those in groups? Uh, and, and again, as I had said um, in my statement, we're trying to automate as many things as we can while still preserving the fact that it's a two-party system. You have an employer and an employee and there are issues that you're going to have to have hearings on. Representative, thank you, Representative Carney. Representative Rikerson is next, um, and then Representative Doerr, then Representative Austin, and then Representative Tucker. Representative Rikerson. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and th uh, thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Actually, I probably shouldn't thank you. I should thank IT because you're not really here. <laughs> so, but um, uh, I find that 
we were talking about structural issues or, or um, systems issues, but um, and a number of times you said this the system is structurally sound, and I definitely agree with that from what I've seen of it. It's structurally sound and it's robust, and I don't think we need a whole new system as, as suggested. Uh, but I do think there could be a huge improvement in just the web interface. Mm -hmm. And that's not somebody who's an expert in unemployment, but somebody who's an expert at programming, but somebody who's a web designer um, that follows basic uh, conventions of, um, of web pages, and that's graphics mostly. So um, there's things on the site that are not really conventions um, that most websites use, like buttons, which is, it means here's something you press for a user uh, action or pull down menus. And it's just not well designed graphically. And um, this is something that really could be improved drastically without huge changes to the program, without any changes to the program, really. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's possible to get, say, three designers, web designers, and take a look at it and offer suggestions. And then, you know, if you can find <clears throat> somebody to change the graphics so they're more intuitive, because I believe there's probably hundreds of people or thousands that are, are really unable um, to access it just because it's a different, different graphic than you're used to. My bank has a superior um, you know, web page, and it's a local main bank. Obviously, it doesn't have volume, but it's just the graphics of the page. Mm -hmm. and that would make it much easier to pe for people to navigate. Um, so I'm just, I mean, and this is something that could be changed in a few hours or overnight. This system might be down. It's not, it's not a, a week-long process to change it. So um, I'm just wondering if you could, um, if you could, since you know we're obviously desperate here, and um, if the, we could get some people just to take a look at that and have some suggestions, because I think it would make a huge difference. Thanks. Thank you. Happy to consider that. Um, Representative Doerr uh, and Representative, and then Representative Tucker. Oh, excuse me, and Representative Austin as well. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I can't, uh, I want to say Laura, but it, it's Commissioner Fortman, sorry. Um, <laughs> can you share with us uh, what the staffing levels were uh, prior to this uh, pandemic and so many people losing their jobs? Uh, and also, um, as of today, um, How can I say this? Let's see. As of today, uh, the various elements of unemployment include phones, claim reps, adjudicators, and appeals. Uh, how many staff do we have right now that are doing this, and uh, what is their level of training? So, and uh, again, I, I may uh, defer uh, the continuation of this comment to the deputy um, Commissioner Kim Smith, but right now we have about um, 100 um, Bureau of Employment Services staff to do claims, appeals, um, tax, um, every function within that Bureau. The benefits staff are the ones that we keep talking about, those 13 benefits staff. We've pulled staff from taxation and everywhere else to work on it. And then we have about 100 claims reps through the um, contract that we have with, a, uh, with the claim service. So basically that claim service, that um, contact center, has, um, has as many people in it answering the phones as we have for the entire bureau performing all of the functions. Um, when um, I was uh, commissioner before, we had about 200 people in the bureau, um, and, and as well as some vacant positions so that we can staff up. So the bureau is about half the size that it was um, about eight years ago. But uh, Deputy Commissioner Smith, is there anything you want to add to that? Hi, this is Kim Smith. No, I think that is an accurate summary of where we are. So just to interject, I mean, I think what you said, you're currently half the size we were eight years ago. 
that in the Bureau of, Un of Unemployment <laughs> Compensation. Representative Doerr, do you have any follow-ups or should we move to Representative Austin and then Representative Tucker? Uh, you could go ahead because my next question was, you know, what was the size of the department in 2009? And, and uh, Commissioner's already answered that. Okay. Representative Austin and then Representative Tucker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for being with us. I want to kind of follow on the thread that uh, both Representative Sylvester and uh, Carney are brought up, and that's kind of just a process thing. And this is really so simple, uh, it's probably embarrassing to share it, but it may be something that if it is not on the website could be a, a help, and I would certainly be more than eager to put it out to my constituents, because I know folks that have called in and they've gotten so far, and then to, to go to the other's comments, there's a glitch or there's something that happens, and then, so they're partway through the process, and so they must not be pushing or having, pushing the right button, as uh, Representative Reikerson has talked about, or they just don't have the necessary information. And I'm wondering if, if it's not on the website now, and I, if it, we could have a list of that pre, those prerequisite pieces of information that they need at the ready, so that we could at least uh, arm them with those as they go into the actual process of applying. If, if that's something that we could take uh, and get out on our systems here, you know, within our districts, I think if it's if that would help, uh, that's certainly something I know we probably most of us would be very happy to do to assist them. So I don't know if you can add to that. Yeah, um, Representative, we do have that information, but again, I agree, sometimes finding things on our website is challenging because there's so much there, and I'd be happy to give you that information um, because there are things that people should have um, before they sit down and try to fill out an application. Um, one of the things that does happen is that um, if you walk away from your computer, so let's say you're you're working on your application, but you think, oh, I want to do direct deposit, but I don't have my bank information, and I go off, um, there's a security feature that automatically shuts you down, and so and that can be very frustrating. Those are great things that see they probably would not necessarily think of, and especially as you said, there's so many that are doing this for the very first time, and being anxious does not help your vision. Are you? <laughs> I know when they're anxious, it it's a lot of information to take in. And so oh, I thank you. Uh, Representative Tucker. Thank you for coming, Commissioner Fortman. I appreciate that. It's, it's wonderful to see you. It's good seeing you too. Um, as a state rep, I don't get calls very often when benefits are granted. Mostly the calls I get are people who are upset or angry with varying degrees of credibility. And so I get the impression as a state rep that, that nothing is right because those are the calls I get. And so I can get all, all tied in knots and their anger and uh, their being upset kind of rubs up on them rubs off on their representatives. But you've told us today that you've had maybe 70% of claims have gone straight through. The 75,000 people are on. $240 million has been distributed. Um, I understand that we've had a saying in the courts and, the, and a saying in the Workers' Comp Commission in processing those type of claims, that 90% of our time was always spent on 10% of the cases. I suspect that phenomenon applies in unemployment. Would you say that's true? I'd say that probably is true, Representative. And also, there, there, are, there are two programs that are going on right now. So you have your state unemployment insurance program, and that has one set of rules. And then you have brand new federal programs that have a different set of rules. And 
all of these must work together. They have to work in tandem. So it is incredibly complicated. And I can understand and sympathize with the frustration people are having as they're trying to navigate their way through this. Yeah. I would just be curious to know, for every complaint call that I get of someone who is messed up in the system and delayed, how many others are actually getting their benefits without mm -hmm. any uh, problems? And uh, they're not calling me up to tell me. We have recently, I mean, the statements that, that I read at the beginning of my, of my statement to you actually came from people. We are starting to get, um, which is why it's heared up, um, we're starting to get uh, thank you notes from folks. So, um, and I figure anyone who sits down and writes us a thank you note, uh, they've had incredible um, uh, service uh, from us because it's been my experience too that people are quicker to sit down and write something when they're when they're motivated because they're upset or they need something rather than when they've actually received what it was they were looking for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I have a number of legislators who've asked to ask second follow-up questions, and I think that's really important. I also think, you know, we did say we'd go to pandemic unemployment at the end, but I know that there are a lot of people at home listening that have some questions about that section of things. But before we move on to people's sort of second round, um, Representative Morris, uh, did you want to ask a question at this moment in time, um, or do you want to reserve your time for later? All right, I'm going to assume that's a reserving time for later. Um, is there anybody else who hasn't asked a question that, that we missed? I don't believe so. Is the, is the consensus of the committee, is it okay if we move to pandemic unemployment for a little bit? Um, that's the unemployment that got rolled out on Friday for the self-employed. Are, are we coming back to this topic? I've, oh, absolutely. If we want to stay on systems for a while, we could stay on systems. I just know that... There are a lot of that were at 10 minutes of three, and I know that there are a number of self employed people that have questions about PUA. I, it had been my understanding that we were going to go by, by section, by category. Okay, yeah. we can do that. We'll stick to that then. Madam Chair, I just had two follow up questions on, on this section. So okay, uh, so Representative Sylvester, I believe Senator Guerin after Representative Sylvester, and then um, Representative Petty. Go ahead, Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I have a couple questions that are follow-up on, on questions. I just want to make sure that for folks listening at home that they have clarity. Uh, the first one is on a question asked by Senator Lawrence. Um, at the beginning of people filing unemployment, a lot of employers had confusion about the fact that their employment rating would not be um, mm -hmm. disrupted or charged for people filing for unemployment, and that there were a lot of employers who reached out to me asking about that and, I, to, and were told that, that it wouldn't affect their rating. Uh, but it, it, the ones who did dispute claims on the belief that it would upset their ratings pushed many people back uh, in the system to be to have to have fact finding and those sorts of things. So, as we are looking for at workers, um, as Senator Lawrence said, being called back to work over the last day or two, I've had many calls from both employers and employees. Employers um, who are asking, what should they do? Um, if workers say they're, they shouldn't come back to work and are under an understanding that they, they should dispute those claims, um, if, if they're not, and, and are asking me if that's true, and employees asking, um, if I go, don't go back to work, will I, do I lose my unemployment benefits? Well, and so you said that you would speak about this on a later date. And so for clarity, um, should employers wait before disputing those claims that their employees, so employee, if they have employees who have been collecting unemployment, should they wait to hear for more clarity from you about whether, or should, and for employees, what should they do? So that's, that's my first question. So, Representative, if I understand your question correctly, um, you're asking are, will employers have their experience rating uh, impacted if employees are collecting unemployment because of COVID-19. Is that accurate? No, I was using that as an example of employers who disputed people's claims under a false impression of how things would work. And so employers are getting ready 
to dispute mm -hmm. claims ba because employees under the act are saying, I'm afraid to go back to work because of COVID. Mm -hmm. I have an immunodepressed child. I have all of these different issues. And you, you said to Senator Lawrence that you would speak about that at a future date. So should, what should employers and employees do until they get more clarity? So it's, um, I, I mean, I think uh, representatives, so, the, uh, so first of all, I just want to be really, really clear. Employers' experience ratings are not being impacted by COVID-19. So let me just say that and then move on to the question that you asked, which is, if an employer is reopening um, and their employee refuses to come back to work, what happens next? Is that accurate? That's it. They have a, you know, they have some reason that to um, fear that going back to work will adversely affect their health because of COVID-19, which is covered under the. Subtitle. Right. So I, that is one of the cases that will require a fact finding. Um, that there are protections under PUA for people to um, refuse to go back to work under certain circumstances. Um, we would. Uh, um, talk to the employee and find out what, um, why they were concerned about this. Did their physician tell them to not go to work? Um, what were the, uh, the reasons why they felt that that could not happen? Did their employer offer them a telework opportunity that they refused? Uh, there are many um, uh, permutations of that, uh, but um, the expectation is that if you are offered suitable work, unless there is that good cause exemption, that you would go back to work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Carney, uh, and you had a discussion about how people who had been denied were automatically rolled over and would accept the, for folks who heard that on the trainings that you offered, on the, uh, on the Zoom trainings that you did uh, before Pula rolled out, and didn't go back and file a new claim. How long do you expect that to for those um, people to for that rollover to, to happen, and for that yeah. people to see checks? I mean, that's the number two question I've been getting over the last day or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair fair question. Um, we anticipate that rollover to be taking place this week, and that uh, checks uh, well benefits. We we all use the shorthand of checks. Unemployment benefits are paid. Uh, either through direct deposit or through a uh, bank card that's issued specifically for unemployment insurance, and uh, those will uh, benefits will be um, paid out within seven days, which is very different than uh, traditionally unemployment insurance takes between ten and fourteen days. Thank you, and then, and then just lastly, you had said you'd take any suggestions. Um, and so two suggestions that have come through uh, while we've been sitting here is, that, is one that, um, you know, it would be helpful to have little links to YouTubes um, on the side of the page to say, yeah, are, you an, are you a sole proprietor? Mm -hmm. Here's how to fill mm -hmm. out this screen, uh, right? And, and, you know, and, and those sorts of things, which, which, again, would just be a link and walking people through screens and seemed like a very good idea. And then, yeah. uh, as we talked about before, uh, people get very frustrated when they see that when they the screen comes up at the end and they're expecting to see success and they see you must you know please call the DOL uh, because we, you have an issue, um, and that perhaps there would be some mechanism for people who have been directed by the DOL to call specifically about an issue, um, so that that they weren't put back at the end of the queue because um, they they feel I, th I think that's one of the largest points of frustration. So I just offer those two suggestions and yep. uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Senator Guerin is next, but I just have a follow-up to Senate, to Representative Sylvester. Um, the majority of people that I heard from that applied on Friday got a message that said you were eligible for zero mm -hmm. benefits, zero, zero, zero benefits. Um, I also heard from some people that said, who got a message that said, you are disqualified until 9,999, 19, what is that, 99.99. Um, those error messages, I think, have significantly contributed to the anxiety. Can everyone who got the, you're entitled to zero benefits, um, be assured that they are in fact going to get benefits? Um, I think there's a great deal of confusion and heartache about that. Yes. 
thank you, Senator. Uh, I uh, appreciate the question and also the anxiety. Um, we, over the weekend, put new wording on that particular new text on that screen uh, to try to make it clearer that the zero benefit was for state unemployment um, insurance, which is a, a necessary step in order to be eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, and I know that was very, very unclear and very confusing for people and I'm sure created all kinds of unnecessary anxiety. Um, but that zero benefit was for main state unemployment insurance and those people um, should check their um, accounts because they should start seeing their um, pandemic unemployment assistance uh, benefits um, start showing up there or the notification of that within about 48 hours. And just to put a finer point on that, because I think people hear state and they say, well, it's the main system. And yeah. I don't think that, you know, at, at, in your introductory remarks, you differentiated between different programs. But I think for most Mainers, especially those who are not, you know, who are filing mm -hmm. for the first time even, it's, it's all coming through the same system. Same so what you're saying is they're ineligible for what existed prior to April 6th to the passage of the CARES Act, but it's good news because that is a first step in being eligible for the benefits that have just come down. So it's good news yeah. to get a zero zero. <laughs> it, it's just as when we sent out denial letters, we were trying to tell people that was actually good news confusing beyond belief, but absolutely accurate. Senator Guerin. Thank you, Madam Chair. My mic wasn't working there. Um, I, I, I'm happy to follow up on Representative Sylvester's um, comments about businesses and the, the the, some of the frustrations of businesses related to the callbacks and I was and I had the suggestion and and a question my suggestion would be a robust statement from from the department and from the administration clarifying that people are expected to go back to work if there is no underlying condition there that stops that I think mm -hmm. I'm hearing from a lot of employers who's um, employees would like to stay out and get the extra $600. So they're, they're making more than they normally make in a week. And the employers are hard, having a hard time conveying that message to them that they are required to come back to work or lose their unemployment benefits unless there's some extenuating circumstance there. So a, a robust statement to employees, I think, would be helpful there. Another um, frustration I'm hearing from employers, and I actually felt that frustration myself, is if, if you are aware of fraud, I, I had somebody apply mm -hmm. for unemployment at my biz, through my business who we had never heard of. So I called the fraud line. Um, I was on hold for over an hour, and then it just disconnected. And I've called repeated times to all of the different employer numbers listed by the state and have been unable to get through ever, even having been on hold many times and then just have it drop the call. So I, I personally am feeling that frustration that Mainers are feeling on drop calls, on, on being on hold for hours. And I did eventually get through and it said, leave your number and we'll call you back. And I thought, oh, golden ticket, they'll call me back. Well, that was last week, and no callbacks. So this person is collecting benefits, and it's totally fraudulent. So, Senator, um, thank you for bringing that to my attention, and I'm sorry that's been your experience. Um, if you would, um, and I'll check into uh, uh, what's happening with our employer lines. Fraud is one of the things that we were extremely concerned about, um, and uh, like every other state, uh, we have integrity measures that we must adhere to. 
And um, if, if you wouldn't mind just sending me an email with that information, um, I would really appreciate receiving it and let's uh, and check into what's happening with our uh, employer lines. Um, as I had said earlier, many of our folks uh, who typically are dedicated to uh, taxes and other employer services um, have been helping out on the benefits side. So that may be part of the issue, but you should still be able to report fraud. We are ex extremely concerned about that and very vigilant about how we follow up on those cases. Thank you. So, Thank you. Senator Guerin, you've moved us nicely into the next section. Um, we want to talk about phones. We have a lot of questions about that. We then want to talk about staffing. Um, I know there are a number of questions from the committee about that and then go back a little bit more into more detail in the online system and some of the problems with the portals, uh, benefits, and then pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, and so you just really flagged one thing, and I, I think we're all hearing from um, many constituents who try and try to call at the right time. They, they follow the rules. They, if their name is Bellows, they do Mondays for a, you know, a, and and can't get through and can't even know. So there's some call centers that allow you to leave a message to get a call back at, at another point. There are other um, you know, when call centers that allow you um, to know what place in line you are so you can know are you number 100,000 as you got on March 31st or are you number 10. And so I think what's really hard is that People are spending hours on the phone and then getting dropped. Sometimes they're reaching a person, and I've definitely heard this multiple times from multiple constituents, and the call get they get hung up on in the middle of a call and then feel like they have to go back to the queue. So is there something we can do with the telephone system to modernize the system itself to create that system where you can get the automated call back um, and know that that's going to happen and not have to carry your phone around. One constituent said she literally got in the shower with a phone on speaker, got out of the shower, and three hours later, um, she could not get through. She never got through that day. Um, so uh, any thoughts about that? Well, um, Senator, first of all, I would say that the um, handling the phones has been, you know, the primary pain point um, since this began, uh, you know, and uh, in my statement, I, I tried laying out all of the steps that we had taken to strengthen the system to move from one um, call network to a different call network. Uh, I think as we're, um, we're trying to ramp up um, uh, the expertise of the people on the line, we are uh, at a place now where we're handling about 1,800 calls a day, and that is up dramatically from where we were six weeks ago, where it was about 300 calls a day. Um, that's We'll continue to try to improve that. Um, the challenge with the call back is that if you're using, if you've got the same group of people, um, whether they're answering the phone or they're, that's how we work on Saturdays, is to try to make those call back um, uh, where people have left uh, messages in the customer messaging portal. Um, but we are open to, uh, to looking at other ways of, of handling that as well. But uh, I don't think you'd find anyone here who thought that, um, that the calls were um, were our best feature. It is definitely not. And some of the hangups, Senator, um, I believe were caused when we were having those system problems. And as I said, the main OIT folks uh, worked 24 hours a day over the course of uh, three solid days to try to resolve those issues. And I believe that that hang up piece um, has been resolved. But if that's still happening this week, please let me know. Representative Cuddy, did you have a question? And then Representative Carney? And then Representative Bradstreet? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, 
Commissioner, I wanted to go back um, a little bit to some things you said before I ask my question, um, just to make sure I'm understanding things correctly. Uh, earlier, I believe you said that the Bureau of Unemployment and Compensation currently has half the staff that did when you left. Am I getting that correct? Roughly. Roughly, yeah. Um, and then the second thing that I would like to ask, and I, I know that you have done this multiple times, but would you, as briefly as possible, walk me through what you did when you expedited claims? I know a number of claims were just approved, a number of claims were just rejected, and could you just briefly walk me through that again? So we were seeing that there were certain types of situations that were um, kind of putting people in a holding pattern and that uh, normally we would require fact finding. Um, we pulled those situations and some of them were, um, there were monetary eligibility. So that gets back to the, did you earn the more than $5,100 in the previous 18 months? Did you earn the $1,700 in the two previous calendar quarters? Um, if you didn't, um, and you had indicated on your, um, your application that you had wages uh, from a particular employer, but the employer's name wasn't there. Um, we looked at all of those things and based on what we saw, um, we were able to say, you know what, these folks were not going to be monetarily eligible. So if we deny them, kind of in a group, and anyone who's denied has appeal rights, so this protects the appeal rights of the person. We did not do anything that removed an appeal right from anyone. Um, but based on the information we saw, we said this group of people is likely, like 99% likely to be denied. Let's go ahead and do that, preserve the appeal rights, so when they get this, if they want to appeal it, they can. Um, but that denial would also free them up to be eligible for, for pandemic unemployment assistance. Also, if we looked at the case and we could see that there were certain kinds of things, like you may have said, oh, I worked at you know um, Scott's Takeout, and then when I looked at the names of the employer there, it was actually you know Cuddy Limited, um, but I didn't realize that that was the same thing, and so I filled out the wrong information. We were saying, yeah, th this really is probably where that person worked. So we tried to look at those issues and say, okay, that person's probably uh, going to be eligible, so let's approve that. Again, um, since this is a two-party system, the employer would be notified that, um, that you know, Laura Fortman was applying for unemployment insurance, and this may be like Senator Guerin's case where it's like, you know, guess what? Laura Fortman never worked for me. So there's there's always that balance. But we just felt that there were thousands of people who were in one of these buckets and we needed to move it forward and preserve the appeal rights for both. So either freeing them to go forward and collect benefits or moving them, denying them so that they could uh be eligible for pandemic unemployment or were presumptively approved. If, if, oh, if they're denied though, did they need to do anything last Friday? If they got no. a denial letter, if they were one of the 7,000 people that said you were denied, they didn't have to do anything last Friday. They should just wait and be patient and they should see some money in the next week possibly? Yes, and they should be looking at their account as well um, and uh, because there is a um, a uh, like a a specific account where information should be populated in there for them as well, but we are not requiring a new application. And would that information be yeah. in the correspondence tab or in a different tab? I uh, Deputy Smith, I th I think it's probably in correspondence, but I don't know yes. Kim if you know. Yeah, this is Kim Smith. So there's a couple of places they can look. They can look at their uh, benefits inquiry. They can look at the summary and see the status of their weekly claims, or they can go over to the inquiry and look at correspondence, and that will uh, have every letter that we've sent them. That's the quickest way to find out what's happening with your account. Uh, a lot of those letters are also sent out through the mail. Anything that has appeal rights, we have to send out through the mail, um, but certainly it's faster if you look at your account. Online. And will that money be in this week 
or next week, forgive me for, for not being clear about that. If they're waiting for money and they didn't do anything, they just are automatically folding into the PUA system, or say they filed last Friday, should they be seeing money this Friday or is it going to take another week? No, it should be this week. Okay. Madam Chair, I had uh, so, one last question. Forgive me, Representative Cuddy, go for it. <laughs> A-OK, -okay. those were excellent questions. Um, so the, the last piece of what I was sort of thinking about uh, with the, the previous two questions was that you are, you're bringing on um, more call volume staff or more call center staff to increase the volume because we do have thousands of Mainers who are unable to get through. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's been any thought given to the possibility of beginning to accept phone calls on the weekend as well as during the week so that people have other days that they could try to get through. Yeah, we're thinking about it, Representative. Last Saturday, we did take calls um, on Saturday. Again, it's, you know, do we have the capacity to do that in terms of staffing? Plus, we do need some time when people are not on the phones in order to return some of the calls and do some of the other work. And let me, let me actually just be super clear, too, because one of the things you said sort of brought this up. The, the amount of work that's being done by the people uh, taking these phone calls, researching it, doing it all is, is enormous. And I'm sure this entire committee understands that. And it is, it is an unbelievable service to the people of the state of Maine that uh, these folks are putting in this amount of time and energy and effort. And that goes for you, uh, yourself and your staff uh, at the top level as well. Um, so I don't want to say that it, the question was meant to be like, you're not doing enough. You need to get more... I'm just looking for ways that we can get more access for the people calling in who are... are reaching a point of desperation right now, but without doing it in such a way that it's going to, um, you know, break the people who are trying to, to man these phones. You know, I've worked shutdowns of 712s, and 712s will, will ruin your spirit, and, and you have folks that are working that long and have been working that long for a while, so I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Carney and then Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, um, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and again, thank you, Commissioner Fortman. I have one follow-up first on Representative Cuddy's question. Uh, is there a specific day of the week or time of day that it's particularly advantageous for people to check? Do, the, for example, do, the, um, do people's accounts get populated with notices at, say, 9 o'clock in the morning or something like that? That's a really good question, Representative, and I do not know the answer to that. Kim, I don't, uh, Deputy Smith, do you know the answer? I want to say most correspondence happens at night. Yes, that is correct. Most of the updates to the system happen through an overnight processing, and then the um, information we would be populated in the claimant's account. Um, I also did want to point out that... Um, we will be sending emails, so as changes are made to people who um, haven't been eligible for state unemployment, as we're rolling them over to PUA, we also will be sending them an email. Great. Thank you. Um, and then a slightly different subject matter. So at some point, there are going to be folks that are applying for the extended benefits and the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. And... Um, Again, I want to emphasize that once folks reach the department staff, they have received the highest quality of service, and we're all grateful for the work that you're doing. Um, in the transition that some claimants are going to be making to these new benefits programs, have you given thoughts to how we can uh, accomplish that change without them having to uh, access an individual Person, are there ways that we can even further streamline the process? Uh, for example, some of the um, guides and instructional suggestions that we uh, were discussing earlier with regard to the PUA. Yeah, and I don't know, Kim, if you want to if you want to talk about this a little, but these are the conversations that we're having now. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the folks who have been who have exhausted their state unemployment, that's the, the next biggest group to work with, and they're impacted by PUA, by the state extended benefits, and by the PEUC. And that we're trying to figure out how we can smoothly move them into whichever program they're eligible for. Um, 
I think initially it will be PUA, and then depending on how soon we trigger on to state extended benefits um, here in Maine, we would need to move them to from PUA to PEUC or state extended benefits. And it's our hope to do that um, automatically, uh, but we're still trying to figure out exactly how that will work. Okay, and then just one quick follow-up. We communicate a lot with our constituents through weekly newsletters and other formats. And if there are simple notices or graphics that you can provide to us, perhaps you can enlist our help in getting the word out to people to make that transition as possible. That'd be great. Thank you. Representative Bradstreet. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in follow-up to Representative Cuddy's uh, concerns about the phone system, I, I think most of the complaints I get, excuse me, are for uh, people waiting and waiting and then getting hung up on. So I, I would just like to urge the uh, either so, a, sort of a queue system or an automated response to give that a very high priority. Uh, having said that, there's another uh, issue regarding uh, fact-finding. Uh, I thought we were going to go in a round and I'd have a chance to ask that earlier, but I'll ask it now. Anyway, uh, for the self-employed, or not necessarily fact-finding, but for the self-employed, uh, what type of uh, criteria do you have, need to determine that they are indeed self-employed? Is there sort of a, is there an I, a copy of an IRS return or a main income mm -hmm. tax return, and how do you verify that? Mm -hmm. So, um, R Representative Bradstreet, thank you for that question. And it's actually a two-step process. The first step is on the application. The person does a self-attestation, and they tell us that they're self-employed, and uh, that is... Um, uh, part of the guidance that we received from the U.S. Department of Labor, that that is uh, sufficient to begin the process. We are also um, in Maine going to be doing a two-step process. So for the self-employed, they're being paid uh, one half of the average weekly benefit. So that is $172 plus the $600 in pandemic unemployment assistance. And then later this month, we will be, again, as Deputy Smith said, we, we're communicating with people through um, email primarily. We will be emailing folks and asking them for copies of their tax documents um, and uploading those and doing the system verification that way. If the um, information that they provide uh, and we'll do redeterminations. So if the information that they provide um, demonstrates that they are, in fact, eligible for more than that $172, uh, we will retroactively pay those benefits. Uh, yes. Uh, regarding that and, and some other issues as well, uh, some of that information is going to be fairly confidential, I would think, to the... Mm -hmm people. And is, is it true that in some certain instances, anybody receiving that information or other information and doing fact finding has to be a civil uh, servant designated person? Merit staff in terms of uh, determinations. Uh, I know uh, Deputy Smith, do you want to talk about this at all? Yeah, it is a federal requirement that anybody who makes a decision on an unemployment case, be it at the adjudication level or at the appeals level, be a merit staff employee. Um, and right now that means we have state employees performing that function. Um, we have not talked about uh, contracting that out at all to somebody. Uh, we've had some organizations say they follow a merit-based process, but we are not considering contracting that out at this point. That's part of the 138 positions that we added with folks to um, be able to do that work. Um, so we're going to, uh, Senator Guerin and Representative Sylvester each have a question. We'll start with Senator Guerin and then Representative Sylvester, and then we're gonna take a break at 3.30 just for um, uh, no more than uh, 10 minutes. I'd ask people to try for five, because um, live streaming breaks are not great for that, but I also, recognize um, that I received a number of requests from committee members for a very brief um, break at 3.30.
Uh, so, Senator Guerin, uh, you have a question, and then Representative Sylvester, and then a very brief um, break for purposes of uh, people being able to, to take a moment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a a as my colleagues have said, uh, the constituents that are contacting me, hundreds of them, busy, call back later, drop call, no callbacks. The Google system that I talked to you about earlier, when I was on that call with the Google executives, they said their system pulls the calls into the cloud, organizes them, and sends them back to a call center. There are no call fails or drop calls. And if anyone from the department had returned Google's calls, they, or their repeated contacts, um, you could have learned that. They use the state's mainframe and keep that in place and it can, it creates an add-on that manages calls and data using the old, the old system, the current system that we're using now, it adds on to that. So I, I really implore you to get in touch with them and see what they could do. The cost of this program, they said, would be about a million dollars. The legislature gave the governor $11 million to work on these systems and help with this pandemic, and none of that has been spent. The $625,000 million coming from the federal government, $1,000 seems like a really small amount of money to be putting to get people a check that have been without money for seven weeks. As as one of the people that contacted me, and, and those of you who know me, this, this isn't normally my kind of language, but they said, what is the plan to answer the damn phone? And, and you know, I, I feel their frustration. What is the plan? So thank you, Senator. I also feel their frustration, and uh, I believe that we laid out the the plan that we had. I believe that we are going to uh, continue to try to staff up. And as I said, when this started, we were answering about 300 calls a day, and we're now at about 1,800 calls a day, and we will continue to improve that. Um, I'm happy to look at whatever it is that, that Google is offering. Uh, you did talk about tying time to the mean frame. frame. I, I just I, think, that I think that from what, what I've heard, I've heard the, the, the services, services that, that they're offering they're are very, very different, different to very to states that have very different systems than we do. But I'm happy to look at it. Representative Sylvester, you have the last question, and then we're going to take a very brief break. I know there are members of the public who are following along um, because they have questions that haven't been answered yet. Um, but yeah, Representative Sylvester. So I just wanted to add on a, on a, I think what is the question that all main people have. Um, we're very happy to hear about the 138 new staff people coming in. Um, do you feel that that is the level? Oh. You missed all the very wise things I just said. Um, and the <laughs> jokes, the anecdotes. I just wanted to end uh, with a, 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 a question I think that all Maine people are asking, which is that uh, you've announced today, which is great, that there's going to be 138 new people and that's bad. Is that the level that you believe is required in order to clear the, black, the backlog and to be able to uh, keep up with new claims? Is, is that the number, 138, that you think we need? Is that... I mean, that is the number that we're putting out there and uh, representative, uh, what I would also want to say is that um, I'm hoping by the end of the week to be able to provide additional information about the, um, the backlog um, because cases are being cleared and people are receiving benefits that are, um, that are uh, fairly significant. We would, we would certainly appreciate that. And, uh, you know, and I know that there's a lot of state workers from other departments um, that feel they have skills. And so uh, I know you're looking in all avenues and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the committee will be at ease. Um, the uh, chairs and leads will return to this room no later uh, than 335, please. So that'll give everybody eight minutes. So we'll, we'll resume at 335.
we're back. Welcome back to the Labor and Housing Committee. I know that members of our committee will be joining slowly, but Representative Sylvester, uh, Commissioner Fortman, and I are here, and we do want to be mindful that there are people who are listening eagerly at home uh, for answers to their questions. Commissioner Fortman, I want to spend a little time with pandemic unemployment assistance. So this is unemployment for the self-employed or for people who did not, were not eligible because of monetary eligibility issues in the past. Um, we have heard reports that some states started processing pandemic unemployment assistance earlier than Maine did. Can you elaborate on that and what barriers existed to us uh, rolling that out? So, uh, Senator Bellows, I think I uh, touched on this in, um, in my statement, but um, basically last week, um, there were about um, 17 states or so that uh, rolled out pandemic unemployment assistance uh, and uh, along with us, I think Maine was approximately in the middle of the pack um, when we began um, either the federal pandemic uh, unemployment assistance program, uh, federal pandemic compensation program, as well as um, the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance um, we really wanted to make sure that when we did it, we would be able to uh, pick up as many people as possible, not just focus on self-employed, that the pandemic unemployment assistance program was really designed to um, allow people who traditionally are not covered by unemployment assistance to receive benefits during this crisis. So that's people who are self-employed, people who are not monetarily eligible, people who are new entrants to the workforce. And um, we wanted to make sure that when we rolled it out, we were able to not just accept applications, which we know many states did, but also begin paying benefits. So let's talk a little bit about, thank you for that um, explanation. Um, we really appreciate you know, hearing that the zero dollar eligibility is, is actually good news, that if they get a message saying that they have zero benefits, it's, the, it's an important first step in getting their, their benefits. What about constituents who received messages saying that they were ineligible until, um, until day uncertain, until 9,999? Um, do you have any information about those types of messages that people received? that they were disqualified from, from the date that they filed to uh, out into the future until um, the year 9,999. So Deputy Commissioner, you wanna take this one? Sure, this is Kim Smith. Um, usually when we see that, it's because someone has filed claims in the past through the Bureau um, and been disqualified and found to have um, fraud. And so uh, that is usually why you see a 2099 expiration date because they are indefinitely disqualified. Um, they do have um, their recourse is to send a letter to the commissioner's office and request that that indefinite disqualification be lifted. The other thing, uh, Senator Bellows, is that uh, pandemic unemployment assistance uh, will pick up people who have been uh, disqualified from state unemployment insurance. So that is one of the issues that we're looking at there as well, uh, whether they would be covered under pandemic unemployment assistance. Okay, the two individuals, I know one of them personally, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain that they've never had a fraudulent claim. So thank you for that explanation. I'll, instru I'll instruct them to follow up with a letter to the commissioner's office for that. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, a state representative uh, who filed for unemployment herself had um, showed some screenshots uh, that I shared on my Facebook page as well, where it looked like people had to answer yes in one spot and no in another in questions about unemployment. 
Um, has that been resolved? Uh, can you elaborate on why it seemed that if you answered that you were self-employed, that it took you down a bit of a rabbit hole into other questions that get you off of the application? So I, I believe, uh, and thank you, Senator, I believe that the question is, if you answer, are you self-employed in one spot, then there's another question that says, uh, name your, can you name an employer that you've worked for in the last 18 months? If someone tried inserting either their own name in that spot, um, that would uh, raise questions about whether or not they were in fact self-employed because the system starts looking for W-2 wages. Um, so again, this system is designed, um, we're building on our existing unemployment insurance system. We made that deliberate decision in order to streamline because you have to constantly check if you're eligible for state unemployment insurance, you are not eligible for pandemic unemployment uh, assistance. So by using the same system, you can verify those, um, whether or not there are W-2 wages that might make someone eligible for state unemployment and immediately uh, act on that. Um, so if the person said, I'm self-employed, I haven't worked for any other employer, they'll go down one path. But if they say, I'm self-employed and list an employer, the system starts looking for those wages to verify that. And that's what um, hangs people up. I also understand that there's a hang up on the able and available form where it asks if you're self-employed, that, that people were told that they should, they should list no there. No. We'll have Deputy to we'll follow up with screenshots for I, you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Without without seeing it, it's hard to to comment. Okay. Yeah. Um, Representative Marshall, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Representative Morris has a question, and he has not yet asked a question in today's hearing. So, Representative Morris, and then Representative Rikerson, and uh, go ahead, and then Representative Door. So, Representative Morris, uh, you can activate your mic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for being here, Commissioner Fortman. My question has to do with, obviously, the phone systems. Um, it was about six weeks ago that we authorized uh, the bill um, dealing with, with the with the COVID-19. Um, I guess with, with the issues that you're having with the phone systems, I'm curious how often you're in contact with the governor and, and if you've had, uh, if you've relayed the issues to her um, and, and how those conversations have gone. Thank you, Representative Morse. Um, yes, the governor is well aware of the challenges that we've had with the phone and uh, has directed every member of the cabinet to help me in any way possible. Been working closely, as I had said earlier, with um, Commissioner Figueroa and her staff at the Office of Information Technology. Her staff worked round the clock for three straight days uh, to help resolve some of the issues. They are on high uh, alert. Any time we have a system failure um, with the phones, um, we are a top priority for all of the OIT staff. Okay. Uh, and just to follow up on the issue with, you, you spoke in your opening remarks about opening up communications with legislatures. I know I tried to call the liaison a couple of weeks ago because I was having issues with a constituent and I never got a call back. Um, so I, I guess, you know, and I know the governor said last week they were hoping to have a person, a point of contact person, because I, at least for me, I, I not only get contacted by uh, by my constituents, I'm also contacted by other legislators who know I'm on the Labor Committee to see if I have any more information. So when is this system, you said hopefully Friday, when is the system going to be rolled out and what is it going to look like? What issues are you considering? 
So, I mean, one of the things that I'm looking for, and again, thank you for the, the question and your patience. I, I can uh, only imagine how frustrating it is on your side of, uh, of, this, uh, of this exchange. I know how incredibly frustrating it is on mine as well. Um, you know, we all want to resolve these issues. I would say that we will have something in place by Friday. I'm hoping to hear from all of you about uh, what would also meet your needs. Okay, thank you. So just to follow up on Representative Mar uh, Morris, he's absolutely right. Uh, what has worked well in the past is having uh, at least one, perhaps uh, a dedicated team of three dedicated constituent service representatives who can respond to legislator concerns because I think we play an important role in amassing like complaints and concerns and so and and as elected representatives we play a really important role in representing the people so if there's anything that can be done uh, to elevate that I, I think particularly for members of the Labor Committee we are doing our best we are reading everything on the website we are posting every day. We are communicating as, as clearly as we can with your department, and we are so grateful for the communications that you have made. But constituent services um, is something that the prior administration did very well, and I hope that it's something that we can restore because it makes a big difference. And I'm not getting people who are locked out because of password problems. And if they send me that email, I can send it to the Career Center because the Career Center is doing a great job on that. The types of problems that we're getting are really big systems issues. You know, people who filed on March 17th and still haven't received benefits because there's something wrong. Um, those are the types of, of thornier issues that we're getting. So I I'm really hope we can resolve that. Uh, Representative Rikerson, Representative Carney, and then Representative Doerr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I did want to commend the department on the prompt action I got for uh, about a blind constituent uh, unable to access. That was very, it was great, it was prompt. It worked. Um, but I have two other questions, if I may, Madam Chair. One is about um, the uh, seasonal workers. Um, are, are they, because they can't come to Maine uh, without, uh, without quarantining, are they somehow uh, captured in maybe in the PUA or, or some other um, aspect? So I, that's an interesting question, Representative, and it's one that we haven't had a conversation about. Can you give me a little bit more information? Are you are you saying that they've come to Maine to work, I have, I have, but they're yes. quarantined? Well, no, I have, uh, for instance, constituents who. Um, who travel around uh, the country for uh, agricultural work? Mm -hmm. um, so obviously during the summer there's uh, there's there's uh, berries and there's mm -hmm. in the fall apples and that kind of thing. So um, I'm wondering about uh, since they're limited in their ability to get here because they have to uh, not work for two weeks. Is there any way they can capture some benefits? Yeah, so I, I, I really don't know the answer. Let me think about it and get back to you. Okay. Um, well, that's good for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Representative Carney, then Representative Doerr, then Representative Petty, and then Representative Bradshaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Fortman, could you please give us a little information about retroactivity and how folks who maybe were eligible for PUA during say the month of April, but who may be returned to work in early May, how will those claims for retroactive benefits be handled? And is there something that we can do to help our constituents and people throughout the state make sure that they get those uh, retroactive benefits if they're entitled to them? Sure, so thank you, Representative Carney. Um, the, when they're filling out the PUA claim, um, they put the date in there that they uh, were impacted by COVID-19, so the day of the layoff or the uh, reason for separation. They use that date, and we are automatically um, putting in, populating it with the dates 
that they would have been eligible um, if they have been filing um, their weekly certification. So it's an automatic reach back for them. And then when they go back to work, if they're working full time um, on their weekly certification, they would be putting their wages and they would no longer be eligible for unemployment benefits. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And then, um, so if they go back to work and they're maybe only working part time, then for example, mm -hmm. they would continue to file the weekly and maybe would be entitled to a little bit of retroactive benefits as well. Uh, it, it, they should be, if they were out of work, if they were out of work any time, they are eligible for retroactive benefits. Great. So it's, and then moving forward, and we do have a, and I think it's a YouTube um, little video explaining uh, how to calculate your um, unemployment benefit if you're earning partial wages. It talks about the maximum weekly benefit of 445. If you're earning more than $5 more than that, then you would not be eligible for benefits during that week. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner, I'm gonna just follow up for one minute. That's a really great point. A lot of Mainers don't know because a lot of states don't have. Maine has partial unemployment. Can you explain what mm -hmm. partial unemployment is and how much a person can make and still qual still keep filing for unemployment if they're working reduced hours? I know, for example, um, many of the uh, stylists at hair salons are mm -hmm. back to work but part-time, or some of the uh, restaurants that are doing only takeout um, the restaurant workers are back to work, but at reduced hours. Can you talk about partial unemployment and eligibility for that? Sure, and um, I'll, I'll do a top line overview, but uh, Deputy Commissioner Smith is much better at explaining this than I am. Uh, but each person has their maximum weekly benefit, and it could vary. The lowest is $77. The maximum benefit is $445. You are allowed to earn... Um, no more than $5 over whatever your maximum weekly benefit is. Um, and, uh, and then there's a $100 offset as well. But uh, Deputy Commissioner Smith, do you want to walk through this? Because you are much clearer than I am in explaining sure. this. Sure, I'd be happy to. As the Commissioner said, um, you know, First off, always file your weekly certification. That is um, step number one after your, your application has gone through. That weekly certification is what triggers your benefit payment. So make sure that you do that. It can be done anytime, Sunday through Saturday, for the week prior. And one of the questions on that weekly certification is, did you work or earn any um, wages during that week? So you would, yes or no, depending on, on what you did for the week. So if you had earnings, Let's say that you are at the maximum $445 and you earned $300 for the week. Um, we would disregard $100 of that. So really, we're only looking at $200 worth of your earnings. If your maximum benefit is $445, you would get um, a reduction of $200. That's the $300 minus the $100 disregard. So you would get 445 minus 200, which is $245. So you have your earnings of $300 for the week and your unemployment benefit of $245 for that week. Representative but if you're Carney, on... Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Representative Carney, do you have any follow-up questions? I did. Thank you um, very much. Just a, a follow-up question, given that Lots of new folks are applying for these benefits may not be aware of A, partial benefit availability, and B, retroactivity. Is there any outreach that um, the Bureau is going to be doing to mainers to make sure that people are aware that they may be able to have to use for those types of benefits? I think, Representative Carney, what we've been doing is we've been talking to every trade group association, put out press releases, put things up on the website. Um, the partial earnings piece uh, I thought was particularly complicated, so we had a an animated um, uh, video done to put that information out there. Um, we're open to other suggestions, but basically we've been talking to anyone who wants to talk to us uh, and push out information as far and wide as we can. 
Thank you, Commissioner. I think that's another one of those uh, things that we can um, promote among our constituents as well by by letting them know about those uh, benefits. Thank you. Um, so just as a reminder to committee members who entered the room late, we're talking about benefits largely right now. And um, I know Representative Doerr has some questions about benefits, and I saw that Representative Petty would like to enter the queue, and I know Senator Guerin would like to enter the queue. So Representative Doerr, you're on. And just as a reminder, for those who are in Teams, you really do have to speak into your computer. We have some microphone issues that have developed a little later in the afternoon. Thank you, uh, Senator Bellows. My question is, uh, how many people who actually filed in, in the first week still have not received any benefits? So Representative Doerr's question is, how many people who filed in the first week? So that's the week of, I want to say, March 15th. Um, and uh, we actually pulled that information last night and I believe the number is 19 but deputy commissioner do you want to can you verify that for me I don't have yeah, that form in front of me from that first week we have 19 people who have not yet received a determination from us um, I, I don't have in front of me how many people from that week were denied um, I'm sure that some of the folks that applied that week were either self-employed people or people who were not monetarily eligible and received a denial, and those folks should be rolling into PUA this week. Um, but there are 19 people from that first week that have not received a determination. Thank you. Uh, I expected that it was going to be a lot more, so 19 is uh, not good for the 19 people, but uh, a lot lower than I had expected. Um, the next question I have: What is the what is the process and wait time for employees that are trying to verify uh, information? So I'm not sure I understand the question, Representative Door. Verify uh, what? Well, don't don't employees have to verify? that employees were employed with, with them oh, in order what for the employees to get benefits. Yes. Got it. So that's why typically under unemployment um, insurance, there's a 10 to 14 day turnaround time so okay. that, um, that that's built into the system. Uh, because of the incredible volume, uh, we're trying to streamline that process as well. Typically what happens is it's an, um, it's an employer and then they have to provide um, what we call a B1, a, 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 which is just the name of the form for okay. each individual employee. That is incredibly burdensome if you have a large employer with you know, hundreds of employees. So we have worked with those employers if they contact us ahead of time and developed a spreadsheet so that they can provide the information to us on that rather than 100 separate pieces of information. Okay, thank you. I'm all set. Uh, yes. Great, Representative Cuddy and then Representative Guerin and I, I saw Representative Bradstreet as well. Representative Cuddy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Um, so the question that I wanted to ask, I actually wanted to step back to staffing um, for just a moment. You have the, the new 138 people you're talking about bringing on in the next several weeks. And I'm very happy to hear that. And I'm sure that the people who are on the phones now and are doing the work right now are happy to hear that there's more help on the way. But why has it taken until this point to make the decision to bring these folks on? Or how long has this been in the works, I guess, to bring these folks on? Yeah, uh, Representative Cuddy, that's a great question. It's not so much that it's taken us so long to make that decision. Um, the decision to hire the, uh, the call center um, was done because we recognized that we would not be able to do the creation of the positions and all of the hire, hiring in a timely manner um, so that that was essential to get people here, get them on the phones, and get people their service. 
Um, I think the deputy commissioner can walk through the steps of what we need to do in order to um, hire uh, employees um, and what that process looked like. And part of it gets back to what I had said earlier about if you don't have vacant positions to start from, you're creating positions. So Deputy Commissioner, you want to walk through how you've been spending uh, part of your life? Well, the first step is to uh, prepare a financial order. Well, first of all, we had to go through and identify what exactly do we need. Um, some of the positions are benefit positions. Some of the positions are tax positions. Some of them are appeals positions. Uh, so we had to figure out exactly what we needed um, and then prepare a financial order that the governor signed, uh, I would say, mm, around the April 20th, although I don't have the exact date. So the financial order establishes the position we also had to prepare what's called a functional job analysis. It's basically to write up what are the specs of the position, submit that to the Bureau of Human Resources so they do their review. Again, everybody was everybody was um, on board expediting this process, but still these are all the steps that we had to go through. So the Bureau of Human Resources looked at that, confirmed that we had the right job classifications. Um, and then um, our staff in, in human resources have been working with us to create the job posting, which those should be going up any day at this point. Uh, and then we go through the interview process. Uh, it's a 14 day posting. Uh, we go through the interview process and, and select the candidates. So that's a, a very high level of what it takes to bring somebody on board. But the, the financial order and the um, FJA, the functional job analysis, are the steps that we wouldn't have had to have gone through if we still had those vacant positions on, on the books. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Director Smith. I appreciate that. So is it fair to say then that the call center, the, the contractor, the call center contractor, was sort of a quick fix to get some people in in an expeditious, expedited fashion while you at, simultaneously went through these steps? Or did these steps begin after that? They were in parallel. Okay, they were at so the same time simultaneously moving forward. Yes. Okay, great, thank you very much. Senator Guerin and then Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, before I ask my question, I just wanna skip back to Representative Doar's question about how many people who applied the first week have not received benefits. I think that number far exceeds 19 from what I've been hearing from constituents it's errors in the computer system and the inability to call back. And a member of my immediate family was laid off that first week. Um, he has called every single day for hours and has not been able to get through to have that adjusted. There, there's some glitch on the computer related to him. And I have heard from many constituents who have been calling from that first week who have not been able to get through. So I'm sure I have talked to more than 19 people myself. So you, you multiply that over the state, that, that number has to be much greater for people who have been seven weeks without a paycheck. Then on to my question. This summer, um, if, if we cancel the tourist season in, in Maine this summer, we're gonna have hardly any summer workers and they're big contributors to the, the unemployment fund. And so that's gonna leave a big hole in that fund in the fall. I, I wondered if you could tell me how much you're spending a week from our state fund, when you think that'll run out. I understand that you can borrow from the feds, but in the long run, we're gonna have to pay that back. And what is the plan to replenish that fund? So, Senator Guerin, I don't have the numbers in front of me for the trust fund, but when we began um, the uh, pan a few weeks ago, um, Maine's trust fund was at roughly 15.8 months of benefits in the trust fund. Um, and so we had a stable trust fund. The federal guidance is that you should have 12 months. Of course, no one ever anticipated the uh, influx, um, the surge that we were seeing in claims. Some of the things that the actions that the legislature took in the Maine emergency legislation were actually helpful. For example, Maine removed the one week waiting period. Under the uh, federal CARES Act, 
They are going to reimburse the state for uh, any state that uh, removed the one week waiting period. We will be reimbursed for that. Also for the pandemic unemployment, the federal um, pandemic, the compensation program, federal pandemic unemployment compensation, the $600, as well as the extended benefit program, uh, those are all 100% federally funded. Um, we began this with about $500 million in the trust fund. And I want to say that the state uh, has been paying out um, about, uh, I don't know, uh, Deputy Commissioner, do you know about like it ranging between 30 and um, I think maybe $59 million out of the trust fund at this point? I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I don't can have get those numbers for you. Yeah, I know the trust fund balance as of today is 378 million. Um, we've been paying out 60 to 70 million a week. Um, most of that actually is is federally funded. So I, we, we can get more details for you. Mm -hmm. Of a breakdown of the federal and the state. Yep. Uh, I think that uh, unlike some other states, we are not in imminent danger of uh, needing to borrow. Um, but we are also incredibly cognizant of the fact that we need to replenish um, any of the federal dollars that we are able to put back into the trust fund. So just to clarify, Deputy Commissioner, you said 378 million in the trust fund now. There was over just over half a billion in the trust fund. So there was five, just over 500 million in the trust fund on March 17th. Correct. So, so we've spent about 122 of state funds. I don't think all of that is state funding, Senator. Because we'll be reimbursed for some of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I know. Am I correct? Um, there's an annual report that you present to our committee, and never did it become more important until this epic. But in looking at that annual report, am I correct that Maine had one of the highest ratings in terms of the health of our fund? And that relative to our neighbors in New Hampshire, for example, they started with 300 million in their fund. Uh, so about 200 million less than we started with on March 17th. And I'm using that date because that's when the legislature passed the emergency legislation. That w I don't have that down in front of me, Senator, but that sounds accurate. Okay. Senator Gannon. And, and Back to, back to the, the question that was, with the diminished um, people paying in from our, our huge summer influx of employees, when, when you come down to the part that is our, our part of the payment, not the federal, how are you planning to replenish that fund? What is the plan? So, Senator, and um, as you know, the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund is paid for by contributions from employers on the first $12,000 of uh, employee wages. So, so are, are you um, inferring that that will be an increase in the employee contribu employer contribution to the fund? I would, uh, that's, uh, Typically, what uh, happens is that um, uh, that assessment is done every uh, fall around September 30th, and we look at uh, the amount that's uh, in the trust fund, and taxes are adjusted at that point. For the last four years, the unemployment insurance taxes have been at Schedule A, which is the lowest schedule uh, possible. Uh, I cannot imagine that uh, taxes will stay at Schedule A uh, during this crisis. And to give some sense of uh, the scope of like, what does that look like for a typical employer? Um, taxes can be as low as zero for some employers and the maximum amount that employers were paying is roughly uh, 600 and I want to say $48 um, for uh, an employee for the year. Thank you. 
Great. Um, Representative Sylvester, did you have a question about the tax issue? If not, Representative Bradstreet was next in the line. You defer to Representative Bradstreet and then back to you? I will defer to the good representative. Thank you. Uh, looking at the call centers, is any consideration uh, been given to rather than hiring uh, independent contractors to repurpose state workers uh, who are maybe not doing as much work as they used to do because of the situation and who are already on the state payroll? Um, Representative Bradstreet, thank you uh, for asking that. And uh, you sound a lot like my boss. Um, so uh, yes, we have looked at that. And in fact, we do have employees from the Department of Corrections who are working with us. We have um, folks from the Division of Administrative and Financial Services. We have a couple of people from um, uh, Workers' Comp, I believe. We have people from Health and Human Services, from Transportation, um, and DAFS uh, has pulled together a list of uh, a pool of people for us to pull from. So. So yes, we have been doing that, and yes, we continue to do that. Representative Bradstreet, follow up. Yep. So uh, the need for a call center as an independent contractor would be minimized. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Um, yeah, uh, Representative Bradstreet, most of these folks um, are doing other tasks. Um, that so some of it is data entry. Some of it is um, uh, program um, management of uh, interfacing with systems that we need done. Um, but I'd say at this point, the call center was the quickest way to get folks answering the phones in and a uh, system in place to handle that. Okay, this is not a follow-up question. This is. A Pretty easy one, I think. I think you've probably already referred to this, but I just want to make sure I get it clear in my mind. Uh, for those people who have exhausted their UI benefits, will they be able to apply again if there are no jobs to go to? If so, then when? And will there be an extension of benefits for those people? So, Representative Bradstreet, I think that's probably two questions. One is if people have exhausted their benefits right now, uh, we, they would um, be enrolled in pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, the state has a state extended benefit program that rarely triggers on, but we anticipate triggering onto that um, in, the, in the coming weeks. So that will be available. And then the federal pandemic um, extended benefit program is also uh, going to be available. And, and our um, goal is to have it as seamless as possible for people and make sure that they are in the correct program and the program that they're in may change uh, depending on the, um, the circumstances. But there, there will be extended benefits for people who need them of, it, of 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, at the beginning of the, the pandemic, as we've talked about before, um, you know, the, the design of unemployment was designed in the 30s. It left out an enormous amount of the new economy. Um, and, and I think what a lot of folks don't understand is that how, a lot of what the state is allowed to do is based on federal guidelines and federal rules and federal laws. And so as we look going forward, um, is there any discussion or movement that you heard in terms of thinking into the future for to include uh, this the new economy, gig workers, sole proprietors, uh, you know, independent contractors? How can we blend them into uh, the the new the UI system uh, going forward? Mm -hmm. Is there any talk of that federally? And then what sort of leeway do we have as a state uh, to begin to move in that direction? So I'm bringing you back, big concept at the end of this. If, Three and plus hours of hearing, I'm, I'm asking for big thinking, so. May not be the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So uh, Representative Sylvester, thank you for that question. And uh, I think the fact that Congress in a bipartisan fashion created these new programs to include all of those people you were talking about um, at least indicates that there is some willingness to look at those issues and a recognition that those people are falling through the, the cracks in the current system. Um, so I, I think that there's definitely interest in, um, in making sure that the system uh, is responsive to the current economy and uh, the folks who need some sort of transition when uh, work is not available. Thank you. Um, I just want to circle back to Representative Bradstreet's question. He asked some excellent questions about staffing. And you said something earlier in the hearing, which was a little bit shocking, and that is that when you left, the department is about twice the size that it is today, um, that there were about 200 employees uh, 10 years ago, and today there are about 100 employees. So, and that's, and 100 is higher than it was just a month ago. So my question is, have you made a systematic list of those 100 employees? Um, and ask people as a civic service to potentially either come back out of retirement or if they're in another place in state government to consider taking a temporary assignment. Um, because I think one of the real challenges is unemployment is so complicated. I think most people think you file and you're done and you're just going to get your benefit. But what you've explained is you file an initial claim. Then there's a check to see if what you say about your wages and your employment matches what your employer says. Then you have to file weekly certifications to verify that you're still willing and available to work and that you haven't found any yet and reporting your wages. If you and your employer disagree or if there's some glitch, then there's a fact finding or an adjudication and that gets scheduled. And at this point, I'm hearing that they're scheduled out until June. And mm -hmm. then once there's a, there's a fact finding, and there's adjudication, you might be denied. And if you're denied, you can then appeal. And there's an appeals process that involves both you and your employer. So the system is highly complex. And so when you talk about hiring 138 new people, thank goodness, let's do it. Let's do it as quickly as possible. But there's a great deal of institutional knowledge, I suspect, in the 100 people that were there when you left 10 years ago who are not there now today. Have you explored that as an option? Because I have to say, those state workers who are working six and seven days a week, 12 hours a day, not seeing their family, trying to work remotely, maybe their kids are, are at home, or maybe their loved ones are in a nursing home or ailing. Uh, it's remarkable what they're doing, and that the fact that we're half staffed from where we are 10 years ago is, I think, shocking and awful. So I think, uh, Senator, the short answer is yes, we have uh, reached out. Was it done in a systematic way through uh, HR? No, we have not. We've been focused on trying to uh, ramp up programs and get benefits out to people as quickly as possible. Okay. I know Representative Morris has another question. Um, Representative Morris, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is actually on the, the pandemic unemployment system. I don't know if we're at that point yet, or? Let's move okay. into that. I think people are waiting for that. I know Representative Cuddy has some questions about that. So let's move in and talk about pandemic unemployment assistance for a little bit. Unless, Senator Guerin, do you have one more question about benefits? Senator Guerin has a question about benefits, and then we'll go to PUA. Senator I'll defer. Thank you, Representative Morris, for letting me cut back in here on, on the um, benefit question. I, I have many different benefit questions that, that constituents have asked me. I have put it out on Facebook if anybody had questions. Um, I think this is kind of a general topic one that, that might hit a lot of people. Th this person earns his entire annual income over tourist season, which means he hasn't earned any money it's since October. When he applied for emergency unemployment, he was rejected because he hasn't worked since last fall. Is, is there a way to fix that glitch? And, and have you looked at what Vermont did? Um, they saw last month they were going through this same kind of 
unemployment compensation system crisis and their governor ordered the state treasurer to send out $1,200 checks to every person in his state who had tried but failed to get through their claim system. Um, at any time, did you propose that to Governor Mills for those who are suffering with no, no pay all this time? Uh, uh, Senator, thank you. Uh, I have not proposed that to Governor Mills. Um, I think that we have a uh, responsibility to try to make sure that we get um, benefits out as quickly as possible and as accurately as possible. And that is what we are focused on doing. And comparing states gets um, tricky because I would not want any other state to try to interpret what we're doing. So I do not want to comment on um, how other states are meeting the individual challenges that they're experiencing. All of the labor commissioners talk on a regular basis. And uh, I believe that the situations that we're in as we all try to um, get benefits out to the people in our states are similar. Uh, the tactics that we use may be slightly different depending on our circumstances. In terms of the constituent that you mentioned, who applied for pandemic unemployment assistance and was told that because they did not have any wages since October. I'm extremely concerned about that. And I want to make sure that that person has applied since last Friday, because based on the description that you gave, uh, they should be eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance. They would not be eligible for state unemployment assistance. So if they applied prior to last Friday, May 1st, they would have been denied state unemployment benefits because the pandemic unemployment assistance program was not up. And I'd be happy to follow up on that with you, Senator. Thank you. I'm gonna do a last call for benefits questions. I do have two. Some people are wanting to know when they get those retroactive funds, particularly the folks who are self-employed, um, will that be in a lump sum, the, the monies that they were entitled to mm -hmm. for April? Okay, so the answer yes. is yes. Okay. And uh, another question I'm getting, especially as we're opening the economy back up, some employers are using the PPP, this is on benefits, and some employers are bringing employees back under the PPP. They are concerned about their employees losing potential income, particularly if they're struggling to bring them back full time. Um, does partial unemployment and the PPP intersect at all, or is it a choice for employers to either bring people back or for people to continue to receive uh, unemployment? Uh, thank you, Senator. It depends on the earnings, their wages, so and their, what their weekly benefit is. But basically, if someone is back at work full time, uh, they, they would not be unemployed and therefore not eligible for unemployment insurance. If they were back at work part-time and the earnings, as Deputy Commissioner explained, were uh, less than their weekly benefit amount would be, they would be eligible um, for partial unemployment benefits. The other program that many employers are using is a work share program. Um, uh, you know, probably a year ago, perhaps three employers were using that. As of earlier this week, there were 129 companies that were using WorkShare. And this is a program where an employer can decide to lay off or reduce the hours of um, kind of everyone equally. And it's between 10% and 50%. Uh, you can't go below 50%. And then for that other 50, let's say it's 50%, you would get partial unemployment for a piece of that. Um, and that's another program that I believe there are about 26 states that offer that program across the country. Maine is one of those 26 states. And that's a program where those unemployment benefits are also um, uh, going to be federally um, federally funded. So I, I think that one of the things I'd like to see moving forward is for us to promote that more, because I think that's a great way 
for employers to, um, to be able to bring their employees back. It also eliminates the challenge that I've heard from some employers about um, that $600 benefit because anyone on work share um, is also eligible for that, that benefit. Um, again, that $600 benefit is time limited. It began with the week ending April 4th and it ends um, the week of July 25th. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Representative um, Austin had a question before we get into the PUA about positions. Representative Austin. Was, um, was Representative Morris going to go ahead or was that was he the next section? He wants to talk about the P Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program for the Self-Employed, the PUA, which we're going to go to shortly. So we're just wrapping okay. up any questions about benefits or staffing. So you had a question about uh, staffing, is that right, positions? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, um, we've heard quite a bit about the 100 positions that over time have been um, taken off from the the role, I guess, you, you know, staffing role. Uh, can, can you remember um, at this point right now today, out of that 100 were a lot of those at the time vacant positions that were not, they weren't filled, uh, mm -hmm. would some, some of those be a, a number within that? And then what about attrition or, or whatever? Can you, can you break that down a little bit for us? Because that does seem like a lot to keep the uh, whole department going, but if they were just some that I know during my first tenure, there were positions that were on the books but weren't filled. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you can kind of break that out for us, might be helpful. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Representative. Um, that's a really good question, and I don't know the answer off the top of my head, um, and I don't know if the Deputy Commissioner does, but I think that is the kind of information that we could provide to you later on, unless, uh, Kim, do you have any um, idea? I, I th think we can certainly provide that information. Um, there was never a, a, a layoff, so if you were asking, you know, was there somebody in those positions and they were cut, I believe it was done through attrition. It wasn't, and it wasn't 100 positions all at one time. This happened gradually over several biennia. And, um, yeah, but we can certainly get that information. Well, that's, yeah, I would love that. I'm sure uh, that everybody else listening, you know, in the committee would like it too, because uh, that sort of serves my memory that we did not cut positions, that mm -hmm. a lot of them might have been people that left and then it just wasn't filled or it wasn't necessary at the time or there was a realignment of the department in that particular sector. So thank you very much. Okay, um, I have one more benefits question that, that we wanted to ask and then we're gonna go into the PUA. Um, and Representative Bradstreet has a benefit for staffing question as well. Um, I just, so I think the weekly certifications is something that's new to people who've never been on unemployment. I think you, you say you file for unemployment and that's what people think filing for unemployment is. But then this idea that you need to weekly report whether you're willing and available to work is new for people who've never ever filed for unemployment. Do you know what percentage of approved claimants are successfully filing their weekly certifications and what communications they get to remind them that they have to do that? Um, and if they forget or they didn't know that they had to are they able to go back retroactively and redo that if that was an error? So off the, thank you, Senator. Um, off the top of my head, I do not know a percentage. We look at the, um, the weekly, the numbers of weekly certifications on a weekly basis. Um, and we could probably make some sort of an estimate about that. But the weekly certification serves a critical role in a couple of ways. Um, uh, we remind people regularly now um, about filing weekly certifications in uh, any Facebook posts that we do or um, on the website, trying to remind people, because I agree, Senator, if people are not aware of this, um, it, it may seem odd. But the weekly certification not only uh, talks about are you able to work, are you available to work, and how you report wages if you have, in fact, done any work. Um, it, uh, it's also um, 
how we are able to verify whether or not you're complying with the uh, requirements to um, to do work search, although work search has been uh, waived temporarily during um, during this emergency. Thank you, Representative Bradstreet. Thank you. Uh, I actually have maybe several questions. <laughs> but not about pandemic, right? No, this there is, are a bunch of people that have questions right, about the pandemic. Right, this is about uh, benefits. Okay. This, this first one seems a little bit unusual, but given the way things are working, maybe it's not that uncommon, and we may be uh, something we want to look at uh, going ahead. And if someone who is initially applies for unemployment compensation, but then finds that he no longer needs to continue with it because his employer has now applied for and been mm -hmm. approved under PPP, how can he get out of the system? Staying mm -hmm. in the system, even though he is now working and does not need or want to be in, is jeopardizing the employer's status with PPP and may be required to pay back those funds. He said the Department of Labor will not let him cancel his claim. Yeah. So thank you, Representative Bradstreet. That is an interesting uh, twist. Um, the, uh, the weekly claim, when someone stops, I mean, I just realized I didn't answer the second part of S Senator Bellow's question. The weekly claim, when you stop filing it, that means that you go to an inactive state and you are able to skip two um, uh, weekly claims before you are declared inactive. That does not mean that you're still collecting benefits, but let's say um, you, uh, you go back, you work for your employer, you're receiving your wages, and um, something unforeseen happens, uh, and that employer has to lay you off again. Um, rather than having to start the process from the beginning, you can reactivate your claim uh, if it's within the benefit year. And a benefit year is determined from the first date that you filed your initial claim through the next year. So there, there's nothing that would jeopardize that employer's ability to get that PPP loan um, if that uh, employee has an active claim, as long as they're not um, continuing to file weekly certifications and uh, as long as they're not fraudulently um, collecting benefits. Okay, thank you. And the next question. Do we have a follow-up on that? Okay. Uh, not really follow-up. Uh, what accommodations are being made for direct reimbursement employers, towns, I'm primarily concerned about? So, uh, thank you, Representative Bradstreet. That's actually an excellent question. Um, the, uh, as, as you probably know, um, unemployment insurance, as we've said before, that is paid for by uh, uh, a tax on employers on the first $6,000 of wages. There are groups of um, uh, organizations or businesses that have the option of being direct reimbursable. So what that means is that they do not pay into the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund However, their employees are covered by unemployment insurance if they lose their job through no fault of their own and they meet the other criteria. And those employers elect to pay um, for whatever the cost is for those employees. Um, and so the employees are paid out of the unemployment insurance trust fund and then uh, those employers are billed. Congress... Um, uh, took action to um, reimburse uh, um, uh, direct reimbursable employers for 50% of those um, costs. So rather than being um, responsible for paying 100% of the benefits, they are um, only going to be responsible for 50% of the benefits. Okay. We are that's a, that's a federal program that's, that's doing that then? Yes. Okay. I, I do have just one more question. Uh, uh, as long as it's, um, <laughs> I know there's a queue. Representative Carney has a question about benefits and then maybe circle back to you and then get to the folks on PUA. Okay. Uh, okay. 
Uh, does the department have any type of way of expediting claims for people in a certain category or from a specific employer or type of employer? The reason I'm asking that is I, I had someone who notified me that uh, a person from a particular company, when they found out where, where he worked, they sped the application right through and he went through with uh, virtually no waiting at all. So I'm just mm -hmm. wondering if there's a, if there's a if there is a special designation for any of these people. So um, I, I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, Representative Bradstreet, and thank you for bringing it up um, so that I can um, explain it, it uh, hopefully a little bit clearer. So normally, if there is any sort of a large plant closing, um, we have our team from the Bureau of Employment Services, our rapid response team, and they would work with the employer. We have adapted that process during this um, situation so that if we hear that an employer uh, is laying off a group of workers, we will work with them, the employer, to gather the information up front, and if the employer is willing to provide that on a spreadsheet, we can quickly go through the process. Uh, and we have offered that to any employer that has reached out to us. It works for the employer because it's less paperwork for them, and it works for the employees because the process is much quicker. We can immediately verify the reason for separation because the employer is telling us that right up front, as well as the wages because the employer is providing uh, that information to us in a simple document. So I think I have one last question on benefits, and then we really want to spend some time on pandemic unemployment um, assistance because we've just heard so much recently from the self-employed or those who weren't previously monetarily eligible. Um, just to return to the weekly certs for a minute, it makes me, you know, that conversation with Representative Bradstreet made me realize I have a number of constituents who are getting the inactive claims message. Is it possible to go back and look at those inactive claims I mean, first, would it just be possible to start sending a weekly email to everyone in the system if you're still unemployed, remember to file a weekly certification? Because the Facebook message is certainly helpful for some, but there are people in my life, I mean, my father's not unemployed, but he's never been on Facebook and is never going to be. So I just think that you, you know, the department has everyone's emails. If we could send an email once a week that says, if you're still unemployed, file your weekly certification, that might be a real help to people. Um, and could we go back potentially and look at some of those inactive claims just to test or maybe send them an email? Because um, that's definitely a complaint that I've been receiving. Um, is it possible that the inactive claim might just be that they failed to file their weekly certs? It, it is, Senator, yes, it is very possible that they uh, failed to um, file their weekly certs. And, um, you know, I'll, we'll consider emails so if someone has an inactive claim, they need to reactivate their claim, and then they could go back and do those weekly certifications under weekly certifications. That's correct. Okay. All right. We spent a lot of time on a lot of issues, but we really do want to take some time with pandemic <coughs> employment assistance. Representative Morris, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I received, I guess I'll start my questioning. I received a... Uh, an email this morning before I came here, and I haven't had a chance to reach out to the constituent uh, as yet, and I'm hoping you can shed some light on his story. Um, what he's saying to me is he was told to file a claim two weeks before May 1st because the money became available and he filed the claim. And after three days of trying to talk to someone about it, he was told nothing can be done because he filed that claim. And they also told him that the claim that had he not filed that claim, he would be all set now. And when he was asked uh, how long he was put on hold, uh, and they have no idea how long he's going to have to wait. So I don't know if you can shed some light on that situation. I mean, uh, about how why he was told to file two weeks ago if, if it wasn't available until May 1st. Um, Representative, I, I 
can't answer that. I don't know uh, if he is self-employed. We've been trying to right. encourage people if they're self-employed to not apply until uh, this was available. However, if he has already applied, um, I, I would guess, but again, without knowing the specific facts, it's hard to you know, make an accurate prediction. But if he truly is self-employed, he will be denied unemployment benefits because we're not going to have wages for him. Uh, and then he should roll over into pandemic unemployment assistance. Do you know approximately how long he'll have to wait to how or anybody, let's take it abstract, anybody in that situation would have to wait for from this to roll over if they, because I think the confusion was that the money they were told the money was available two weeks ago in 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 this system wasn't ready to roll until last fr uh, Friday. So, uh, Representative, thank you. And this is very confusing and perhaps what you can do. Um, I think this gets back to your, your question about can we do a, some sort of constituent support here? Um, because I, I think for me to even begin to dig into this, I'm going to need more information. Um, the first thing that crosses my mind is I don't know who told him that money was available or what that means or whether or not he filed an application and it appeared that he was monetarily eligible. I mean, there it's a lot of unknowns there, Representative, but let's try to talk. No, I, I appreciate I appreciate that. We, we can do that. I, I guess, again, the, the question, though more now, is um, those folks that, that may have, such as him, um, may have jumped the gun and filed earlier, because I understand it, confusion can happen. Right. How long are they going to have to wait, you know, once, because the, obviously they're going to be denied, but how long for it to roll over? And I guess, are those people going to need, are you asking them to file a new claim, a, a second claim again to, to make sure or? Yeah, our goal, and again, I'm saying no, and I can see the deputy shaking her head saying no. Our intent is not to do that. We do not want people to have to refile. Um, what is, um, you know, every situation is different though. So we would have to see what that particular person did. But okay. in the abstract, if uh, people erroneously filed, they will be denied and it will be rolled over and we're looking to uh, take much of that action um, later this, this week. How many claims are in the system right now? So when you say how many claims are in the system, in the, there yeah, are... No unemployment system? Uh, I, I don't have numbers on pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, we are only able to release um, uh, weekly claims uh, information on Thursdays at 8.30 because that is considered sensitive economic data and based on the um, uh, agreement that we have with the U.S. Department of Labor, no state is allowed to release that information until 8.30 a.m. on Thursdays. So tomorrow I will be able to uh, give you weekly claims data for last week, and that will include pandemic unemployment assistance numbers uh, from uh, Friday and Saturday. Those will be included in the weekly, in the weekly numbers. Okay. So we have Thank you. Representative Brakerson, then Representative Cuddy, then Representative Carney, then Representative uh, Senator Guerin. Um, uh, so, Representative Brakerson, you're up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was wondering, um, similar, an analogous situation was when they rolled out the uh, Affordable Care Act, where there was a whole system of navigators to assist people in their. Um, in a, in a totally new system, something that had never been created before. So it's kind of similar to the PUA, I think. I'm wondering if there's a way that we can employ the, um, uh, say, community action programs or, uh, or some kind of community programs that would assist in navigating this system that we ourselves 
even though we're delving into it, are still confused about. Mm -hmm. So that's basically my question. Okay, so Representative, um, we are thinking along similar lines. There is a, uh, you know, who knows um, how far we'll get with this, but um, there is a U.S. Department of Labor dislocated worker grant that we either applied for yesterday or we are applying for today and requesting, um, uh, we're thinking of it as like a peer-to-peer uh, kind of navigator to help through this system. Great. Representative Petty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Fortman, um, first off, thank you for being here for what has turned into a, a relatively long day. And um, thank you for your attention to detail and your answers and, and for your staff uh, also for being here as well. Um, so my question uh, is around the PUA program, and it, it sort of rests around the idea that the administration inherited sort of a, a lower number of workers, and we clearly couldn't handle the historic, and I want to emphasize historic onslaught of, um, of regular UI claims. Um, we have thousands of people who are still waiting, and we've talked about some of the ways in which you guys are, are getting at those folks now and, and trying to help them out. Um, and the feds then put in place, you know, this new PUA program. And I'm grateful that they did because as, as we've discussed, the system hasn't kept up with the economy. And, and this is sort of a, a, a quick way that the, the feds tried to make something work. But that also adds on to DOL, this new level of complexity and a new layer, as well as an entirely new cohort of people um, that we are not we don't typically think of as being uh, able to claim unemployment. Mm -hmm. So we already have this onslaught of cases that we found we've had difficulty keeping up with because it is, as I said, completely historic. And then we have this new cohort of people and an entirely new system to deal with it. So knowing this was coming along and knowing that, you know, obviously you had to get the guidance from the federal government before you could really move on it, but how are we going to be able to continue to do this in an orderly fashion. I, I should, let me step back a second. What do we do to put it together so that you could do this in an orderly fashion because you've already started accepting the application? Mm -hmm. And how are we gonna keep this from just completely overwhelming the system? So excellent questions, Representative Cuddy. I think that um, one of the things that we are doing is doing it in a two-step process. So the first thing that we did was on May 1st begin accepting um, the, uh, the applications and begin paying benefits. So by the end of this week, um, uh, many people will begin to receive some of the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance benefits. We are not requiring a two-step application process that some other states are. We are also putting in place uh, by the end of the month, a system to upload the tax documents that will be required to verify the um, earnings for self-employed people. Um, we are doing this very deliberately so that it is an automated process for the vast majority of people. And that was one of the steps that we're taking that um, is a little bit different than some of the other states. We are going to, our goal is to have that process automated so that it does not require as much human intervention and therefore um, winnow down the numbers of people that we have to have uh, the kinds of um, complicated um, interactions with that um, can occur. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the um, I attended one of the the online tutorials you did uh, regarding PUA, and if if I remember correctly, if somebody applies, uh, a sole proprietor uh, applies for PUA, they're gonna automatically just begin receiving a set amount. I think it was like $172 a exactly. week. Exactly. Yep. In, in addition, the 600 federal dollars Correct. they're receiving, and then. Eventually, 
you will have them upload these financial documents through this hopefully automated system, and that will determine um, whether or not they actually qualify for a higher level of benefit. And mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, that 172 was a federally mandated number. You can't go below that if you're a sole proprietor. Is that correct? You, uh, that is the, um, and it's not the 172. It's the one half of the uh, weekly benefit of the average weekly benefit. So that that amount varies from state to state, but the formula is one half of your state's average weekly benefit. Okay. Um, and so the, the documents do not need to be uploaded yet, yeah. even if they apply on Friday, and you will let people know when that needs to happen. That is correct. And we will be doing that uh, through email. Okay. And, and we're uh, and again, um, Representative, getting back to your point about you know what are you doing to try to like throttle the the load um, that that we would be asking people to provide that information in um, in chunks mm -hmm. so that we're not sending it out on you know Monday and saying by five o'clock tonight we need everything from everyone. Right, right. And, and the last question I had over PUA was. The money going out for PUA, does any, all, some of that come from our trust fund, or is that all federal money? All federal money. Okay. The Thank money you. for PUA is all federal. The money for um, the $600 is all federal. And the extended benefit program, the federal extended benefit program is all federal. In addition, the 50% um, Five zero percent of the direct reimbursable will be federal, and the one-week waiting period that the Maine legislature um, agreed to eliminate during this time frame will also be federal. Great, thank you for that. Representative Carney, you had some questions about PUA, and then Senator Garrett. I did. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair and um, Commissioner Fortman. I just want to let you know how impressed I am with the breadth, breadth and detail of the information you're providing. Uh, it's, it's very impressive. And um, I just wanted to point out something that I think is a really fabulous example of the work that your department is doing on the PUA. There's this handout that I printed off the website. I don't know if you can see it, but it's just a really, really clear graphic that explains to people who is eligible for PUA. And I think that, you know, this heading in this direction is a really fabulous way to uh, facilitate people getting benefits. It's basically just a list of all of the scenarios that um, might apply to somebody and whether or not they are covered by the PUA program and should apply. And my question to you is, if for the PUA in particular, if people are in doubt as to whether or not they might be eligible, should they go ahead and apply? Definitely. And, and we say that, uh, thank you, Representative Carney. I mean, we tell anyone who thinks that they're eligible for unemployment benefits to apply. And for PUA, because it is covering such a wide swath of folks, uh, they should, if they believe that they're eligible and they have had some connection to the workforce, they should definitely be applying. Thank you. So Senator Guerin, uh, you have a question. I just want to interject. I do think that there's some pieces like that that are very helpful, but I think the internal communications within the system, and we've already spoken about the messages that say, you are entitled to zero dollars um, within the system that are creating such anxiety for people. And I guess one of the questions I have is, do department staff have the ability to go into the system itself, the re-employee which we contracted out two years ago, do department staff have that ability to go into that system and change some of what is said on those screens so it doesn't generate the panic and anxiety of you're entitled to zero dollars? Because I think that's such a clear contrast. You've got this great checklist. It's, it's written and easily understood terms that Representative Carney downloaded from the website, but the website is not actually connected to the re-employee system that you actually have to use to get your benefits. And so when you're inside that system and you get these messages that, that are 
are really confusing and, and also seemingly contradict common sense, I think it's only natural that people start hitting those phones and you get 1,800 calls on a Monday and most of those people can't get through. So is, there, is, is that something the department has the ability to do? So, Senator, um, our relationship with the contractor is a partnership. So we work in, um, in a team with them. So it's not as though there's a group that, that there's a vendor off somewhere doing something, and then we have our staff over here. There is a coordinated team made up of Department of Labor subject matter experts and the technical uh, folks in the vendor, um, and uh, but uh, changing the language is um, well uh, is uh, something that requires everyone to come together uh, to um, make those changes. And uh, at this point, we have been focused on bringing up the new federal programs and have not uh, diverted the um, energy. To, uh, to working on these other um, enhancements that, that we agree would be, would be good to have. Forgive me, maybe I'm not being clear enough, but you know, I, I, in, my other, in my day job, I, I run a nonprofit. I don't do the software, the website programming, but I can go in and change the language on any page on my site and say, you know what, that is not appropriate. I wanna change it to say this. Does the department, like, does your amazing communications person have the ability to log in on the back end and just change some words to simplify the language or change the message from you're entitled to zero dollars to thank you for submitting your initial claim. It has been received. You will hear from us in 10 to 14 days. Uh, no, that is not something that we have the capacity to do. It's part of the... It's part of the, I mean, we can do that on our website, but not, not as part of the re-employee system. Senator Guerin, um, and I just say, if there was a way to change that, I think that could be huge, because I think communications is a big piece of that, um, because people are taking at face value the information that they're receiving, mm -hmm. and they don't know that you know, the message that they're receiving, you know, it's, it's like, don't worry, the bad news is good news, but that's very counterintuitive. Right. Senator Guerin. I, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I absolutely agree with uh, Senator Bellows that those messages drive people to the phone that are already backed up by the unemployment. So it, it's just exacerbating that problem. So if we could get some screen changes, that certainly would be helpful. Um, Commissioner Fortman, you've been in this role before, and that, that's helpful, and it's not your first implementation of a program, I'm sure. So I wondered in those past implementations, did you seek input from the governor, the s president of the Senate, or the Speaker of the House, and in developing this pandemic unemployment assistance program, how did the information flow from the vendor to your department to the governor's office of how that it was going to be set up? So, Senator, this the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program um, is a federal program, so our interactions were uh, primarily uh, with the U.S. Department of Labor. And before implementation, was there any coordination with the governor, the speaker, or the president of the Senate? Uh, I mean, the governor's office, of course, was updated on a regular basis about our progress. But there was, I, I'm unclear about what you mean by coordination, Senator. Our task was to implement I, I, it as quickly as possible within the constraints of the federal law. Um, I, I, I think I, I'm trying to get at the implementation, the, the, the question Senator Bellows had of how, how this, the screens looked and how, 
that the rollout was coordinated with the unemployment knowing that there would be glitches and, and it would just add to those people who had already been in there for seven weeks trying to get their payments? I, again, um, I'm trying to understand the question. I think the direction that we had was to implement pandemic unemployment assistance as quickly as possible, as accurately as possible within existing um, federal guidelines. And that is what we did. And we were using the um, existing reemploy me system because that system was structurally sound and that seemed to be the quickest way to uh, get money into the hands of the main people who desperately needed it. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from members of the committee of, about the PUA? I have a couple that I want to, Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to touch on some seasonal workers that we haven't talked about. Representative Rikerson talked about agricultural workers, but we have college students who are all finishing up. Uh, many of them are home, but online, finishing up their semesters who normally have regular employment in the summer. Uh, many at the same employer, employer recurring summer after summer who are counting on that money for tuition. And so I wanted to touch on what is available for college students who wouldn't necessarily normally have the, um, wouldn't qualify for the regular unemployment system, but what is their uh, ability to qualify under any of the other federal programs, whether PUA or other programs? So, Representative, the connection needs to be related to COVID-19. So if you traditionally work at a, I, I don't know, an ice cream shop or a lawn care um, company. And for COVID-19 related reasons, that company um, ha is not going to hire you. And you can document that with a letter from that company. Uh, that is something we would look at. But this is for people who have um, two things, a connection to the workforce. So if you've never worked before um, and you have no connection to the workforce, uh, this, is, it, this is still an unemployment program. However, if, as you laid out, there is, um, it has already been a job offer, uh, maybe when you were home over you know, the winter break, you spoke to someone and they said, yes, I can't wait to see you on May 31st. Um, and you've got that documentation, that would be, cons and, but the business is not opening or not hiring, um, that would be uh, something that we would look at um, as uh, someone being potentially eligible for PUA. So for example, I mean, I have um, employees in my business who've worked for me six years in a row, who mm -hmm. come back every year uh, you know, and have their W-2s from year after year. And my understanding is, and I want to give a chance on this too, is it's for seasonal workers that you can use 2018 if you haven't filed 2019. I wanted to make sure that folks knew that. Uh, but that sort of folks can get a letter from an employer mm -hmm. and send that in to you. And that would, yes. yeah, okay. So that, that's because I've had a lot of students reach out about uh, who filed and got a, um, an ineligible. And uh, so that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we would be reaching out to you as the employer to verify that at some point. I look forward to it. Other questions from members of the committee? Anyone um, uh, on PUA? I've got a couple, but I, but I want to give members of the committee the opportunity to talk first. Anyone online? I'm seeing shaking heads. I, ju I just want to go back to the online portal because I think there are problems on the front end with the communications with reemploy me. And I hear you that this is a partnership and that structurally you think the system is sound. And, and I trust that structurally it may be, but the usability of it um, raises some grave concerns. And I, I hope you can work with the vendor. Um, this has been a problem since the beginning, but 
on some of the ability of the Maine Department of Labor to go in and make some common sense changes to the language within the portal. But I have a few concerns about the back end as well. Um, I understand that um, the, your department is having to go back in and manually backdate the PUA claims for the businesses. Are, are there other, are you having system slowdowns or system challenges with your employees um, able to access the system on the back end besides the electricity, which is understandable, but are there elements of being able to work on the system by the employees that are contributing to some of the anxiety and some of the delays in, in accessing benefits? That's not an issue that's been raised with me, Senator, but uh, I will check with staff. I've heard reports of some lag times and just some real challenges from some staff. So I think that's, that's worth it. Senator Dan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, just another thing along that line. This is from a, a Facebook post yesterday that somebody posted, and I think it shows some of the total confusion on, on the online system. Attention self-employed. If you are self-employed and have no wages with an employer in the calendar year 2019 or 2020, you must select no for question four. Do not select a state on question five. To deselect a state, double click on your selection to remove it. It, it, it. It's just all so complicated that people are overwhelmed with trying to get through and then the message comes back, not approved, so they head for the phone. So we, we, we just desperately need to streamline that system and make it common sense. Like, couldn't we have it select a state? Because this is Maine. So to just take out some of the extra verbiage that is confusing people. Thank you, Senator. And uh, yes, I think that anything we can do to make it easier for people to understand will not only reduce their frustration, and as you said, um, reduce calls, um, and we are open to doing that as quickly as we can um, within the constraints of um, that we're operating in. Representative Carney, you have a follow-up? I do, and it's on the same um, questions that you and Senator Guerin were asking. Um, Commissioner Fortman, are there barriers to working with the company, I guess it's called Reemploy USA, that um, are preventing us from going into the, the back of the system, so to speak, to make those changes? Um, Representative Carney, no, thank you for the question. There are no barriers to working with them on that. It's just the sheer volume of what we're trying to accomplish. And so my priority is, and I think I had said it a, like um, a while ago when we were talking about how to approach this, um, we did some things about uh, getting, um, eliminating, getting out the denials to people as well as approving a bunch of um, changes. I made that decision, but that we've got a core group of people, including with the vendor that we're working with who are working on these issues. So if I pull them off working on PUA, to work on this other thing that I also thought was really important, which was to clear up roughly 12,000 claims. It, it's all a matter of um, where are you focusing your resources? And my focus has been, what do we need to do um, that will stand up these new programs so that people will get the benefits as quickly as possible? And um, it was not uh, done. I mean, if we had, you know, six months to think about this, we would be doing, you know, more um, bring in users and test some of this and how does this messaging work. Uh, we have not had that time. And so in the absence of that time, what I have been focused on is what do we need to do to get benefits to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And um, and those were the decisions that I made. Yeah, I actually did 
the basis of my question was more of a concern that there was something that we're hearing back from the Freedom for USA and put back. So, Representative Carney, there's something wrong with your uh, with your internet. We can't hear you. If you want to type your question in the chat, then we could we could verbalize it for you, but we can't hear you. Can I tr can you hear me now? Sure. Yep. Okay. Uh, no, my question really had to do with whether Reemploy USA, the kind of parent company for the Reemploy Me system, was was difficult for you to work with for reasons that didn't have to do with our department, but that had to do with their responsiveness. No. Okay. Uh, that has not been my experience, Representative Carney. They have been very responsive to our needs um, as as we've been working through this. Mm -hmm. And then just one final question. Do you, um, are you able to sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel where you're going to be able to go in and make those changes? I would um, hope uh, that, uh, you know, once we get the um, state uh, extended benefit program up, when we get the, the step two in PUA where we're uploading the data and uh, when we get the federal pandemic, um, the benefit program up, that we'll have some breathing space. We may have a little between now and then, but again, we still have significant chunks of work to do uh, to get um, those other programs up. And we are also uh, working very, very hard to make sure that um, we continue to get at least uh, that 70% uh, um, and increase it higher to 70% of people. We're, our goal is 100% of the people receiving benefits as quickly as possible. Thank you. Representative Rikerson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, um, in the interest of usability, I'm just wondering, um, the internet is such a democratic uh, small d process mm -hmm. that um, I think that maybe just a, like a dedicated email address for suggestions, not complaints, um, <laughs> You may get, you know, a thousand complaints, but you might get two good suggestions mm -hmm. on how the website could be improved and the process could be improved. And now that you have all these self-employed gig workers um, applying through PUA, you might actually get some good input from those people. So I'm just throwing that out to see that that's possible. Yeah, thank you, Representative. And actually, I think we did get one of those emails. Um, I don't, I don't even know what day today is. I guess it's Wednesday, maybe on Monday. Um, that was funneled through uh, a representative, and there was actually someone who had applied um, and uh, had some really good suggestions uh, along the lines that you're talking about. So I think you're right. The more people who use it, um, probably. Uh, this is not how we would design a uh, to get user feedback, but I think that we will be, and we should be using whatever information we get. Well, pretty easy to set up a dedicated email address to do that. Mm -hmm. Senator Gehring, you had a PUA question? Yes, thank you. Um, in the CDC briefing today, the, the governor was responding to questions uh, about the system failures that we had been asking. They were asking her about that. And she said that she, um, the state has spent millions trying to fix the system and it's still not working correctly. And they used 100 contractors, which I'm sure must have not been the actual number. Um, can you give some clarity to that? How much has been spent? How many vendors you have used? You have contractors you have had look at the system? I, I, I'm sorry, Senator. I, I think I was with uh, you during that briefing, and I, I, I can't comment on it. You don't know how many people have worked on it, or um, how much money has been spent on trying to fix the system in the Department of Labor. I, I don't know what system we're talking about trying to fix, Senator. The, the online. We have not 
contracted with anyone to fix the system. I'm not sure if this was in reference to when the unemployment insurance program was created back in 2017. We are part of a consortium. There was roughly $92 million of federal funds that were used at that time. Um, but, but again, I'm not sure. I, 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 I frankly, I don't have the context, Senator, so I am not sure what was said. Point of order, I don't think we can ask her to comment on something that's been said in a different meeting. I mean, she literally worked right here with us. So, so, so what I am asking is how much has the state spent in trying to fix the online and phone system so far? So uh, I can look at uh, what, again, I, I need to understand the fix. So um, I can tell you we have a contract with the contractor that has been in place since 2017, but I, I, it's unclear to me whether that's the question that you're asking. Okay, thank you. So um, we have, uh, I have a constituent last night who contacted me and said I've been scheduled for a fact finding on June 8th. And um, we're hearing from a number of people um, who think that they're applying for the PUA or there were some people who had filed who were self-employed who've been scheduled for fact findings last week. And on the day of their fact finding actually didn't receive a call. Um, and now we're hearing from fact findings that are, that are scheduled out until June. Um, one, are there more adjudicators to do the fact finding being hired? Because um, that definitely seems to be a challenge um, to tell mm -hmm. someone. Um, this woman who called me last night, um, she and her husband are both fairly low wage workers. Um, and his, the restaurant he works at is closed and does not appear to be reopening. And they're just desperate for help. Um, so. Do you have a sense of um, whether you have enough adjudicators, whether you're hiring more adjudicators? And if people didn't receive a call on their day of their fact finding, is that something that they can elevate to their elected representative that we can elevate to you? Please, uh, uh, Senator, I'll answer the last part of your question first. Yes, please elevate that to me. Um, and yes, uh, we are hiring more adjudicators as part of that 100 and um, 38 positions that we're, we're looking at. Uh, as you laid out very clearly, unemployment insurance is not a fill out an application and receive uh, a check. There, it's um, multi-stage with appeal rights throughout the process. And we do know that, um, that filing an initial claim is just step one. And we need to make sure as we move forward in this process um, that uh, we are um, building in the skill sets that we need. Um, does, do any other, I have a couple of other questions that are off of PUA um, to just finish up. Do any other committee members um, want to have any questions about PUA? Okay, so one of the things we've been encouraged to do if constituents can't reach anyone on the phone to go on the Department of Labor's website use the contact us form, click unemployment and submit an online message. I know a few weeks ago when you were doing the weekly briefings, the response time for those online messages was seven days. Uh, has that shortened? We were advised earlier this week that there was an indication that it might have been shortened to 36 hours. Um, one constituent said, I'm just very skeptical of that. Do you have any sense of what the average response time is in the online messaging portal? And is this still that the best way for a constituent to just at least stake their claim or state their problem if they're having a difficult time reaching someone on the phones? Thank you, Senator. Yes, the um, online messaging portal is the best way to, uh, to um, document uh, what the problem is. We have career center staff who go through the um, customer messaging portal uh, every day and work on that. Anytime someone is uh, not on the phone, so for example, on Saturdays when um, 
we're working, that's one of the tasks that we're engaged in. But uh, I would say that it is much closer to two weeks before someone is getting getting back to someone uh, through that messaging portal. Although we are, again, trying to clear out as many groups of those as possible. And one of the things that we have seen is that due to the frustration, due to um, people just wanting answers, that uh, frequently when we resolve uh, one of those issues, we're also looking to see if that person has entered something more than once, and we frequently are able to close out um, a number of those um, uh, customer messaging portal messages. Uh, we are also doing a, a check back and forth uh, and building this into the system so that if you talk to someone, they're also trying to check to see if they have a message in the portal to shorten down those lists and close that all out at the same time. We talked a lot about the portal. What if someone doesn't have internet? What if they don't have email? What if they don't have internet? I know the phones are overwhelmed. Is there something that we can do for people who are stuck in that digital divide? I, I'm open to your suggestions, uh, Senator. I think that those are very likely the people that we need to make sure are elevated through um, through legislators directly to us okay. so that we can handle that. Any other questions from members of the committee before we move into next steps? Um, I did, uh, a senator asked me to just say, big picture, everyone that filed, you know, there's 3,000 people that filed last Friday. There's a lot of small self-employed business owners who are just feeling a tremendous sense of anxiety. Is there any affirmative message about when they'll start um, receiving their funds? And you know, uh, is there is there a sense that some of those PUA people will start receiving funds this this week? Yes. Yeah. I mean, and that Senator, that's what we've been saying from the beginning, yeah. is that um, we uh, anticipate that uh, people will be receiving their pandemic unemployment assistance within seven days of uh, filing their. Um, their certifications. Great. Any other, so I think we had a couple questions about next steps. Um, any other last questions that people wanted to ask? Senator Guerin, did you have anything else that you wanted to ask before we go into next steps? No. Anyone um, online? The chair invites you to speak if you want to. I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. Okay, so we did just want to talk a few, a little bit about next steps. Um, is there, from the, from your department's perspective, you know, we are doing our very best to respond to constituent concerns, to triage, as it were, to answer these questions when we have the answers. Um, do you need us to change statutes or laws? Do you need more funding from us? Is what, is there anything that we can do? to help you uh, in addition to the work that we're doing in terms of serving our constituents and helping triage some of the challenges our constituents are having and help educate them about how the system works. So Senator, I, I think that, um, you know, Representative Sylvester started laying out some ideas a little while ago about whether or not the unemployment insurance system as it is currently constructed continues to meet the needs of uh, today's workforce. Um, I think that that is a conversation that we should have when we um, get to the other side of this, um, because it's obvious that if Congress has to create a brand new freestanding program um, to cover the people who so desperately need benefits right now that the uh, coverage of unemployment insurance um, as constructed right now does not meet the needs of today's workforce. Also, um, there would need to be considerations about if this is a social insurance program, which social, um, which unemployment insurance is, then how do you, um, how do you fund 
uh, a program like that when you're trying to bring in a, a broader group of people? I think that's a reasonable question to try to to, to try to figure out. Um, and uh, I think that uh, from today's conversation, you know, um, communication. I, I don't know. I, I don't know of anyone who works in any organization anywhere who says communication is perfect and there's no need to improve it. Um, I think that uh, we have a challenge um, with our communication and that we need to uh, work on resolving that. And then the other thing is uh, education. You know, when this started almost seven weeks ago, uh, we were flooded initially by, by calls, by um, applications from people who did not understand anything about unemployment insurance. Um, there were lots of um, misconceptions. Uh, and I think, Senator, you laid out a lot of those you know, that it is a two-party process, that it is a federal-state partnership, uh, that uh, there is, it is not just um, I'm out of work and therefore I receive benefits. Um, so I think that the more education we can do, the clearer that communication can be, uh, the better off um, we will be. And the, the other thing that we did not talk about at all today is recipiency. Um, that was another issue we had started looking at before the pandemic hit, um, and that is a requirement, which I was happy to see in the federal programs, uh, that we are um, instructed to look at what is the recipiency rate uh, in unemployment insurance. And basically what that means is if you have uh, workers who have lost their jobs, how many of them know about unemployment, how many of them are, apply for unemployment insurance, and then how many of them are actually covered by uh, unemployment insurance in, in each of the states. And I believe in the past, Maine has been in about the middle of the pack. Um, but again, uh, I, I, I couldn't um, provide an exact uh, place for us, but I think those are the kinds of issues that we need to be looking at moving forward. Thank you, Senator Gunn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one thing I, I wondered if you would start thinking about and, and talking with the governor about is um, the liability of an employer if an employee becomes sick and sues them. Uh, I, I'd like to see something about you know, the employer being held harmless unless an employee can pr prove that they got sick at work due, due to gross negligence, the, you know. So I was wondering if the department could look into possibly publishing some sort of rule or statement related to that. Hmm. I think that's a policy conversation in this committee probably for next year because I, I heard from, I had an employee call me yesterday and they are a frontline worker and their employer said they couldn't wear a mask because it would send the wrong message. I'm sending them a copy of the governor's executive order that says everyone has the right to wear a face covering. But this is a perfect example um, of you know, that tension and there, it's a mutual responsibility. Employees have a responsibility to their employers but employers to the responsibility. This hearing's about unemployment so let's I, I think we can have a, a lively conversation, but I, 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 I would. I, I, I would say that this is about next steps, and I, I think that is a future step we need to look at. If an employer is telling an employee they can't wear a mask, maybe that would fall in the gross negligence category. But, um, and the other, the other thing I wanted to mention, which I'm sure Senator Bellows will have an opinion on, is I, I think another thing that we should be looking at and the department should be recommending is a freezing of the minimum wage increase that is due next January because we know employers are barely hanging on. Many are already going out of business. So that's, that's another question I'm sure would be controversial. Just as a reminder, unfortunately, minimum wage, or fortunately, minimum wage is tied to the rate of inflation next January, so there are no more dollar increases, it will, and I, I, I don't see um, an inflationary pressure in the current uh, recession that we're experiencing that may be a depression. 
yes, so perhaps it would be good time to, to realize that that policy going forward is the best. So one of the things that I'd like, Commissioner, is really to, I think we really need to continue to think collaboratively about what the state can do to modernize the unemployment insurance program, to really better align it with its underlying purpose and modernize the technology, but also the um, you know, recognize the changes that are happening in our society and our workforce, how people work um, and how mobile, uh, how many people who are self-employed or gig workers or have multiple jobs. I think all of those points that you've raised are a really important piece of, of this conversation. Um, I really appreciate, I just want to say one more time on behalf of the entire committee, those state workers who are processing all of these claims, my understanding is we've received more claims in the last five weeks than we have in years. There's no precedent for it. To go from 600 claims to over 20,000 claims, to have processed at this point over 70,000 claims in such a short time and paid out over $200 million in benefits to our friends and neighbors is really, really remarkable. And to every one of your employees who's working 12 hour days, six or seven days a week, and yourself as well, I think we just wanna say thank you for being here with us today. And we all know this needs to be fixed. It needs to, we need to do better, but we wanna recognize your achievement and your, your, and how hard you've worked. So, Representative Sebasti, you have something, and Representative Bradstreet? I just wanted to say, Commissioner, again, thank you for being here. I, want, I hope you will extend on our behalf, um, you know, as Senator Bellow said, uh, you know, just the heroic work that the state workers who have come from all departments um, to put hands together to make sure that claims, the claims that have gone through have get through and that people's calls are answered as, as you've been able. And, and we appreciate the, you know, to, to hear today about the staffing increases and, uh, you know, and that, uh, you know, so many people can expect to see uh, the federal programs rolling out in the short term. And I guess what I would like to say is, you know, what my caucus hears me say all the time is that the services that you provide um, have been understaffed for years. And the programs that you provide, educating employers, keeping employees safe, and providing a safety net for the unemployed um, are some of the most crucial programs in the state. And so I, what I am hoping is that uh, coming out of this crisis and next steps, that we will see the value of those programs, that we will staff those programs appropriately, that we will have um, you know, the resources in place so that when Mainers uh, are in need, whether that's an employer needing an education or it's an employee, uh, you know, needing to uh, make sure that their, their workplace is safe or whether it's a Mainer in, in you know, a crisis situation in their lives that, that the DOL will be there, will be resourced, will be staffed um, and that you have everything you need uh, to, to make sure that that happens. And I, I appreciate you being here today. Um, Representative Bradstreet, you had a comment about next steps? Yes, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, uh, you oversee a department that is being fed a lot of people. Uh, which points to the underlying issues that we have in here, and that's the, the, the state of Maine's economy. And I would hope that you would urge the uh, governor to open the lines of communication so that we can work on all these issues collaboratively. We'll get a lot more done together than we do separately. You know, we're, we're in this together. It's got to be more than a platitude. And I hope that we can uh, have those lines of communication open for the benefit of all Mainers. Thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, um, I'll entertain a motion. Oh, Representative Rikerson. <laughs> Representative Rikerson. Thank if you. I just anyone want, else online, we don't, I wanted to th thank them. all the state workers who have been working so hard. That's all. Great. Representative Petty. Representative Petty, did you want to say anything? Oh, I suppose. Representative Carney. Yeah, I just want to echo the thanks to all of the state workers who have gotten so much, um, so many benefits to the people of Maine, and especially for the kindness and how they handle the people who are so anxious and stressed when they call in. Senator Guerin. 
Well, um, I will close as I had opened, thanking you for your hard work. And I also want to send out an apology to the people of the state of Maine for the lack of response in their time of need. I, I sincerely, my heart breaks for them. I, I know when you were talking about the dedication of your employers before, it brought tears to your eyes, Commissioner Fortman. It, it is brought tears to my eyes. I, I have talked with people on the phone who were crying and desperate because they have no income. So thank you for getting right on this and, and seeing what we can do to get those checks out to the people who need them. Thank Representative you. Morris. Okay. Is there anyone else um, online that has wanted to say anything? Okay. So, I would love to. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you, Senator Bellows. I just want to give a, 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 a shout out to our, our state employees, having been a state employee for almost 30 years. Uh, it, it's been very difficult for them. And I also want to give a shout out to all the small businesses. I grew up in a small business. It's a difficult time. It's a time that we have never been through before. But if I think if we work together, we will get through this. Thank you, and thank you to all the committee members. Thank you. Uh, there are about 200 people that stayed with us on the live feed for all uh, about this time. Um, and I think it's a testament to what Senator Guerin and Representative Bradstreet said earlier, that there are people in need, and we all have to work together to make this work. It's unacceptable that people have been gone so long without the support that they need. We know. They're having a hard time meeting their bills, buying groceries for their family, and we are all in this together. It needs to be collaborative, and um, let's continue to work hard on this, and let's make sure the lines of communication are open between the executive branch and legislators so that we can elevate those challenges if someone is completely shut out of the system or if they're not getting their fallbacks or they're getting confusing information. So to those 200 plus people who just listened to a four and a half hour legislative uh, committee briefing. Um, please, this isn't the end of the conversation. Uh, and please reach out to us. Please reach out to your elected officials. We are going to do our best and we need to make this better. Um, and we will get through this together. Thank you, Commissioner. We really appreciate your time. Um, Thank you. We're adjourned. Move to adjourn.